Section 21 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19, Lincoln's Nomination in 1860, Part 2. The situation which the Illinois delegation faced, briefly put, was this. The Republican Party had in 1860 but one prominent candidate, William H. Seward. By virtue of his great talents, his superior cultivation, and his splendid services in anti-slavery agitation, he was the choice of the majority of the Republican Party. It was certain that, at the opening of the convention, he would have nearly enough votes to nominate him. But still there was a considerable and resolute opposition. The grounds of this were several, but the most substantial and convincing was that Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey all declared that they could not elect Seward if he was nominated. Andrew G. Curtin of Pennsylvania and Henry S. Lane of Indiana, candidates for governor in their respective states, were both his active opponents, not from dislike of him, but because they were convinced that they would themselves be defeated if he headed the Republican ticket. It was clear to the entire party that Pennsylvania and Indiana were essential to Republican success, and since many states with which Seward was the first choice held success in November as more important than Seward, they were willing to give their support to an available man. But the difficulty was to unite this opposition. Nearly every state which considered Seward an unsafe candidate had a favorite son whom it was pushing as available. Pennsylvania wanted Cameron, New Jersey, Dayton, Ohio, Chase, McLean, or Wade, Massachusetts, Banks, Vermont, Colomer. Greeley, who alone was as influential as a state delegation, urged Bates of Missouri. Illinois' task was to unite this opposition on Lincoln. She began her work with a next-door neighbor. The first state approached, says Mr. Sweat, was Indiana. She was about equally divided between Bates and McLean. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday were spent upon her, when finally she came to us, unitedly, with twenty-six votes, and from that time acted efficiently with us. With Indiana to aid her, Illinois now succeeded in drawing a few scattering votes, in making an impression on New Hampshire and Virginia, and in persuading Vermont to think of Lincoln as a second choice. Matters began to look decidedly cheerful. May 14th, Monday, the New York Herald's last dispatch declared that the contest had narrowed down to Seward, Lincoln, and Wade. The Boston Herald's dispatch of the same day reported, Abe Lincoln is booming up tonight as a compromise candidate, and his friends are in high spirits. And this was the situation when the convention finally opened on Wednesday, May 16th. The assembly room in which the convention met was situated conveniently at the corner of Market and Lake Streets. It had been built especially for the occasion by the Chicago Republican Club, and in the fashion of the West in that day was called by the indigenous name of Wigwam. It was a low, characterless structure, fully 180 feet long by 100 feet wide. The roof rose in the segment of a circle, so that one side was higher than the other, and across this side and the two ends were deep galleries. Facing the ungalleried side was a platform reserved for the delegates, a great floor 140 feet long and 35 feet deep, raised some four feet from the ground level, with committee rooms at each end. This vast structure of pine boards had been rescued from ugliness through the energetic efforts of the committee, assisted by the Republican women of the city, who, scarcely less interested than their husbands and brothers, strove in every way to contribute to the success of the convention. They wreathed the pillars and the galleries with masses of green, hung banners and flags, brought in busts of American notables, ordered great allegorical paintings of justice, liberty, and the like to suspend on the walls, borrowed the whole series of Healy portraits of American statesmen, in short, made the wigwam at least gay and festive in aspect. Foreign interest added something to the furnishings. The chair placed on the platform for the use of the chairman of the convention was donated by Michigan, as the first chair made in that state. 
it was an armchair of the most primitive description the seat dug out of an immense log and mounted on large rockers another chair one made for the occasion attracted a great deal of attention it was constructed of thirty-four kinds of wood each piece from a different state or territory kansas being appropriately represented by the weeping willow a symbol of her grief at being still excluded from the sisterhood of states the gavel used by the chairman was more interesting even than his chair having been made from a fragment of commodore perry's brave lawrence into the wigwam on the morning of the sixteenth of may there crowded fully ten thousand persons to the spectator in the gallery the scene was vividly picturesque and animated around him were packed hundreds of women gay in the high-peaked flower-filled bonnets and the bright shawls and plaids of the day below on the platform and floor were many of the notable men of the united states william m everts thomas corwin carl schurz david wilmot thaddeus stevens joshua giddings george william curtis francis p blair and his two sons andrew h reeder george ashman gideon wells preston king cassius m clay gratz brown george s boutwell thurlow weed in the multitude the newspaper representatives outnumbered the delegates fully nine hundred editors and reporters were present a body scarcely less interesting than the convention itself Horace Greeley, Samuel Bowles, Murat Halstead, Isaac H. Bromley, Joseph Medill, Horace White, Joseph Hawley, Henry Villard, A. K. McClure, names so familiar today, all represented various journals at Chicago in 1860, and in some cases were active workers in the caucuses. It was evident at once that the members of the convention, some five hundred out of the attendant ten thousand were not more interested in its proceedings than the spectators whose approval and disapproval quickly and emphatically expressed swayed and to a degree controlled the delegates wednesday and thursday mornings were passed in the usual opening work of a convention while officers were formally elected and a platform adopted the real interest centered in the caucuses which were held almost uninterruptedly illinois was in a frenzy of anxiety no men ever worked as our boys did wrote mr sweat i did not for the whole week sleep two hours a night they ran from delegation to delegation haranguing pleading promising but do their best, they could not concentrate the opposition. Our great struggle, says Senator Palmer, was to prevent Lincoln's domination for the vice presidency. The Seward men were perfectly willing that he should go on the tail of the ticket. In fact, they seemed determined that he should be given the vice presidential nomination. We were not troubled so much by the antagonism of the Seward men as by the overtures they were constantly making to us they literally overwhelmed us with kindness judge david davis came to me in the tremont house greatly agitated at the way things were going he said palmer you must go with me at once to see the new jersey delegation i asked what i could do well said he there is a grave and venerable judge over there who is insisting that lincoln shall be nominated for vice president and seward for president we must convince the judge of his mistake. We went. I was introduced to the gentleman, and we talked about the matter for some time. He praised Seward, but he was especially effusive in expressing his admiration for Lincoln. He thought that Seward was clearly entitled to first place, and that Lincoln's eminent merits entitled him to second place. I listened for some time, and then said, sir you may nominate mr lincoln for vice president if you please but i want you to understand that there are forty thousand democrats in illinois who will support this ticket if you give them an opportunity we are not whigs and we never expect to be whigs we will never consent to support two old whigs on this ticket we are willing to vote for mr lincoln with a democrat on the ticket but we will not consent to vote for two whigs I have seldom seen a more indignant man. Turning to Judge Davis, he said, 
Judge Davis, is it possible that party spirit so prevails in Illinois that Judge Palmer properly represents public opinion? Oh, said Davis, affecting some distress at what I had said, oh, Judge, you can't account for the conduct of these old locofocos. Will they do as Palmer says? Certainly. There are forty thousand of them, and as Palmer says, not one of them will vote for two Whigs. We left the New Jersey member in a towering rage. When we were back at the Tremont house, I said, Davis, you are an infernal rascal to sit there and hear that man berate me as he did. You really seem to encourage him. Judge Davis said nothing, but chuckled as if he had greatly enjoyed the joke. This incident is illustrative of the kind of work we had to do. We were compelled to resort to this argument, that the old Democrats, then ready to affiliate with the Republican Party, would not tolerate two Whigs on the ticket, in order to break up the movement to nominate Lincoln for vice president. The Seward men recognized in Lincoln their most formidable rival, and that was why they wished to get him out of the way by giving him second place on the ticket. The uncertainty on Thursday was harrowing, and if the ballot had been taken on the afternoon of that day, as was at first intended, Seward probably would have been nominated. Illinois, Indiana, and Pennsylvania all felt this, and shrewdly managed to secure from the convention a reluctant adjournment until Friday morning. In spite of the time this maneuver gave, however, Seward's nomination seemed sure, so Greeley telegraphed the Tribune at midnight on Thursday. At the same hour, the correspondent of the Herald, New York, telegraphed, The friends of Seward are firm and claim ninety votes for him on the first ballot. Opposition to Seward not fixed on any man. Lincoln is the strongest and may have altogether forty votes. The various delegations are still caucusing. It was after these messages were sent that Illinois and Indiana summoned all their energies for a final desperate effort to unite the uncertain delegates on Lincoln, and that Pennsylvania went through the last violent throes of coming to a decision. That night was one of the dramatic episodes of which none, perhaps, was more nearly tragic than the spectacle of Seward's followers, confident of success, celebrating in advance the nomination of their favorite, while scores of determined men laid the plans ultimately effective for his overthrow. All night the work was kept up. Hundreds of Pennsylvanians, Indianians, and Illinoisians, says Murat Halstad, never closed their eyes. I saw Henry S. Lane at one o'clock, pale and haggard, with cane under his arm, walking as if for a wager from one caucus room to another at the Tremont House. In connection with them, he had been operating to bring the Vermonters and Virginians to the point of deserting Seward. In the Pennsylvania delegation, which on Wednesday had agreed on McLean as its second choice and Lincoln as its third, a hot struggle was waged to secure the vote of the delegation as a unit for Cameron until a majority of the delegates directed otherwise. Judge S. Newton Pettis, who proposed this resolution, worked all night to secure votes for it at the caucus to be held early in the morning. The Illinois men ran from delegate to caucus, from editor to outsider. No man who knew Lincoln and believed in him, indeed, was allowed to rest, but was dragged away to this or that delegate to persuade him that the rail candidate, as Lincoln had already begun to be called, was fit for the place. Colonel Hoyt, then a resident of Chicago, spent half the night telling Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania what he knew of Lincoln. While all this was going on, a committee of twelve men from Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa were consulting in the upper story of the Tremont House. Before their session was over, they had agreed that, in case Lincoln's votes reached a specified number on the following day, the votes of the states represented in that meeting, so far as these twelve men could effect the result, should be given to him. The night was over at last, and at ten o'clock the convention reassembled. The great wigwam was packed, with a throng hardly less excited than the members of the actual convention, while without, for blocks away, a crowd double that within pushed and strained, every nerve alert to catch the movements of the convention. 
the nominations began at once the hon william m everts presenting the name of william h seward the new yorkers had prepared a tremendous clack which now broke forth a deafening shout which says leonard sweat i confess appalled us a little but new york in preparing her clack had only given an idea to illinois the illinois committee to offset it had made secret but complete preparations for what was called a spontaneous demonstration from lake front to prairie the committee had collected every stentorian voice known and early thursday morning while seward's men were marching exultantly about the streets the owners of these voices had been packed into the wigwam where their special endowment would be most effective the women present had been requested to wave their handkerchiefs at every mention of lincoln's name and hundreds of flags had been distributed to be used in the same way a series of signals had been arranged to communicate to the thousands without the moment when a roar from them might influence the convention within when n b judd nominated lincoln this machinery began to work it did well but a moment later in greeting the seconding of seward's nomination new york outbellowed illinois caleb b smith of indiana then seconded the nomination of lincoln says mr sweat and the west came to his rescue no mortal ever before saw such a scene the idea of us hoosiers and suckers being out screamed would have been as bad to them as the loss of their man five thousand people at once leaped to their seats women not wanting in the number and the wild yell made soft vesper breathings of all that had proceeded no language can describe it a thousand steam whistles ten acres of hotel gongs a tribe of comanches headed by a choice vanguard from pandemonium might have mingled in the scene unnoticed as the roar died out a voice cried abe lincoln has it by the sound now let us ballot and judge logan beside himself with screeching and excitement called out mr president in order or out of order i propose this convention and audience give three cheers for the man who is evidently their nominee the balloting followed without delay the illinois men believed they had one hundred votes to start with on counting they found they had a hundred and two more hopeful still no other opposition candidate approached them pennsylvania's man according to the printed reports of that day had but fifty and one-half votes greeley's man forty-eight chase forty-nine while mclean pennsylvania's second choice had but twelve if seward was to be beaten it must be now and it was for pennsylvania to say the delegation hurried to a committee room where judge pettis disregarding the action of the caucus by which mclean had been adopted as the delegation's second choice moved that on the second ballot pennsylvania's vote be cast solidly for lincoln the motion was carried returning to the hall the delegation found the second ballot under way in a moment the name of pennsylvania was called the whole wigwam heard the answer pennsylvania casts her fifty-two votes for abraham lincoln the meaning was clear the break to lincoln had begun new york sat as if stupefied while all over the hall cheer followed cheer it seemed but a moment before the second ballot was ended and it was known that lincoln's vote had risen from one o two to one eighty one the tension as the third ballot was taken was almost unbearable a hundred pencils kept score while the delegations were called and it soon became apparent that lincoln was outstripping seward the last vote was hardly given before the whisper went around two hundred and thirty one and one half for lincoln two and a half more will give him the nomination an instant of silence followed in which the convention grappled with the idea and tried to pull itself together to act the chairman of the ohio delegation was the first to get his breath mr president he cried springing on his chair and stretching out his arm to secure recognition i rise to change four votes from mr chase to mr lincoln it took a moment to realize the truth new york saw it and the white faces of her noble delegation were bowed in despair 
Greeley saw it, and a guileless smile spread over his features as he watched Thurlow Weed press his hand hard against his wet eyelids. Illinois saw it, and the tears poured from the eyes of more than one of the overwrought, devoted men as they grasped one another's hands and vainly struggled against the sobs which kept back their shouts. The crowd saw it, and broke out in a mad hurrah. The scene which followed, wrote one spectator, baffles all human description. After an instant silence, as deep as death, which seemed to be required to enable the assembly to take in the full force of the announcement, the wildest and mightiest yell, for it can be called by no other name, burst forth from ten thousand voices which we ever heard from mortal throats. This strange and tremendous demonstration, accompanied with leaping up and down, tossing hats, handkerchiefs, and canes recklessly into the air, with the waving of flags, and with every other conceivable mode of exultant and unbridled joy, continued steadily and without pause for perhaps ten minutes. It then began to rise and fall in slow and billowing bursts, and for perhaps the next five minutes these stupendous waves of uncontrollable excitement, now rising into the deepest and fiercest shouts, and then sinking like the ground swell of the ocean into hoarse and lessening murmurs, rolled through the multitude. Every now and then it would seem as though the physical power of the assembly was exhausted, and that quiet would be restored when all at once a new hurricane would break out, more prolonged and terrific than anything before. If sheer exhaustion had not prevented, we don't know but that the applause would have continued to this hour. Without, the scene was repeated. At the first instant of realization in the wigwam, a man on the platform had shouted to a man stationed on the roof, "'Hallelujah! Abe Lincoln is nominated!' A cannon boomed the news to the multitude below, and twenty thousand throats took up the cry. The city heard it, and one hundred guns on the Tremont House, innumerable whistles on the river and lake front, on locomotives and factories, and the bells in all the steeples broke forth. For twenty-four hours the clamor never ceased. It spread to the prairies, and before morning they were afire with pride and excitement. And while all this went on, where was Lincoln? Too much of a candidate, as he told Sweat, to go to Chicago, yet hardly enough of one to stay away. He had ended by remaining in Springfield, where he had spent the week in restless waiting and discussion. He drifted about the public square, went often to the telegraph office, looked out for every returning visitor from Chicago, played occasional games of ball, made fruitless efforts to read, went home at unusual hours. He felt in his bones that he had a fighting chance, so he told a friend, but the chance was not so strong that he could indulge in much exultation. By Friday morning he was tired and depressed, but still eager for news. One of his friends, the Honorable James C. Conkling, returned early in the day from Chicago, and Lincoln soon went around to his law office. Upon entering, says Mr. Conkling, Lincoln threw himself upon the office lounge and remarked rather wearily, Well, I guess I'll go back to practicing law. As he lay there on the lounge, I gave him such information as I had been able to obtain. I told him the tendency was to drop Seward, that the outlook for him was very encouraging. He listened attentively and thanked me saying I had given him a clearer idea of the situation than he had been able to get from any other source. He was not very sanguine of the result. He did not express the opinion that he would be nominated. But he could not be quiet, and soon left Mr. Conkling to join the throng around the telegraph office, where the reports from the convention were coming in. The nominations were being reported, his own among the others. Then news came that the balloting had begun he could not endure to wait for the result. He remembered a commission his wife had given him that morning, and started across the square to execute it. His errand was done, and he was standing in the door of the shop talking, when a shout went up from the group at the telegraph office. The next instant, an excited boy came rushing pell-mell down the stairs of the office, and, plunging through the crowd, ran across the square, shouting, 
Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Lincoln, you are nominated. The cry was repeated on all sides. The people came flocking about him, half laughing, half crying, shaking his hand when they could get it, and one another's when they could not. For a few minutes, carried away by the excitement, Lincoln seemed simply one of the proud and exultant crowd. Then remembering what it all meant, he said, "'My friends, I am glad to receive your congratulations, and as there is a little woman down on Eighth Street who will be glad to hear the news, you must excuse me until I inform her.' He slipped away, telegram in hand, his coat-tails flying out behind, and strode towards home, only to find, when he reached there, that his friends were before him, and that the little woman already knew that the honor which for twenty years and more she had believed and stoutly declared her husband deserved, and which a great multitude of men had sworn to do their best to obtain for him, at last had come. End of section 21 Section 22 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. The LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. The Campaign of 1860, Part 1. Thirty-six hours after Lincoln received the news of his nomination, an evening train from Chicago brought to Springfield a company of distinguished-looking strangers. As they stepped from their coach, cannon were fired, rockets set off, bands played, and enthusiastic cheering went up from a crowd of waiting people. A long and noisy procession accompanied them to their hotel, and later to a modest two-storied house in an unfashionable part of the town. The gentlemen whom the citizens of Springfield received with such demonstration formed the committee, sent by the Republican National Convention, to notify Abraham Lincoln that he had been nominated as its candidate for the presidency of the United States. The delegation had, in its number, some of the most distinguished workers of the Republican Party of that day, Mr. George Ashman, Samuel Bowles, and Governor Boutwell of Massachusetts, William M. Everts of New York, Judge Kelly of Pennsylvania, David K. Carter of Ohio, Francis P. Blair of Missouri, the Honorable Gideon Wells of Connecticut, Amos Tuck of New Hampshire, Carl Schurz of Wisconsin. Only a few of these gentlemen had ever seen Mr. Lincoln, and to many of them his nomination had been a bitter disappointment. As the committee filed into Mr. Lincoln's simple home, there was a sore misgiving in more than one heart, and as Mr. Ashman, their chairman, presented to him the letter notifying him of his nomination, they eyed their candidate with critical keenness. They noted his great height, his huge hands and feet, his peculiar lankness of limb. His shoulders drooped as he stood, giving his form a look of irresolution. His smooth-shaven face seemed of bronze as he listened to their message and amazed them by its ruggedness. The cheeks were sunken, the cheekbones high, the nose large, the mouth unsymmetrical, the underlip protruding a little. Irregular seams and lines cut and creased the skin in every direction. The eyes, downcast as he listened, were sunken and somber. Shaded by its mass of dark hair, the face gave an impression of a sad, impenetrable man. Mr. Ashman finished his speech, and Mr. Lincoln, lifting his bent head, began to reply. The men who watched him thrilled with surprise at the change which passed over him. His drooping form became erect and firm. The eyes beamed with fire and intelligence. Strong, dignified, and self-possessed, he seemed transformed by the simple act of self-expression. His remarks were brief, merely a word of thanks for the honor done him, a hint that he felt the responsibility of his position, a promise to respond formally in writing, and the expression of a desire to take each one of the committee by hand. But his voice was calm and clear, his bearing frank and sure. His auditors saw in a flash that here was a man who was master of himself. For the first time they understood that he whom they had supposed to be little more than a loquacious and clever state politician had force, insight, conscience, that their misgivings were vain. 
why sir they told me he was a rough diamond said governor boutwell to one of lincoln's townsmen nothing could have been in better taste than that speech and a delegate who had voted against lincoln in the convention turning to carl schurz said sir we might have done a more daring thing but we certainly could not have done a better thing and it was with that feeling that the delegation two hours later left mr lincoln's home and it was that report they carried to their constituents but one more formality now remained to complete the ceremony of abraham lincoln's nomination to the presidency his letter of acceptance this was soon written the candidates of the opposing parties all sent out letters of acceptance in eighteen sixty which were almost political platforms in themselves lincoln decided to make his merely an acceptance with an expression of his intention to stand by the party's declaration of principles he held himself rigidly to this decision his first address to the republican party being scarcely one hundred and fifty words in length though so short it was prepared with painstaking attention he even carried it when it was finished to a springfield friend dr newton bateman the state superintendent of education for correction mr schoolmaster he said here is my letter of acceptance i am not very strong on grammar and i wish you to see if it is all right i wouldn't like to have any mistakes in it the doctor took the manuscript and after reading it said there is only one change i would suggest mr lincoln you have written it shall be my care to not violate or disregard it in any part you should have written not to violate never split an infinitive is the rule mr lincoln took the manuscript regarding it a moment with a puzzled air so you think i better put those two little fellows end to end do you he said as he made the change his nomination an accomplished fact the all-important question for mr lincoln was can i be elected six months before when he had asked himself can i be nominated he had been forced to reply not probable even the very morning of the nomination he had said despondently to a friend i guess i'll go back to practicing law but now when he asked himself can i be elected the answer he gave was far from uncertain with the tables of the popular vote since eighteen fifty six before him he reckoned his chances twenty-four states out of the thirty-three which then formed the union had taken part in the chicago convention these twenty-four states held two hundred and thirty-four of the three hundred and three electoral votes to be cast on how many of them could he depend in eighteen fifty six the first time the party had appeared in a presidential contest it had secured for fremont eleven states one hundred and fourteen electoral votes on these lincoln felt he could still count but that was not enough nor was it all the republicans claimed the growth of the party had been steady and vigorous since eighteen fifty six the whole country saw that if the chicago convention chose a presidential candidate acceptable to new jersey pennsylvania indiana and illinois those states would certainly go republican lincoln added their votes to the one hundred fourteen of the certain states it gave him one hundred sixty nine a respectable majority of the three hundred three which the electoral college would cast the tables were in his favor but that was not all in the situation which encouraged him lincoln saw that as his nomination in chicago had been largely the result of disagreement among the republicans so there was a possibility of his election being the result of quarrels among the democrats the national democratic convention had met in charleston south carolina on april twenty third from the opening the sessions were stormy one vital difference divided the body the south was determined that a platform should be adopted stating unequivocally that slaves could be carried into the territories and that neither congressional nor territorial legislation could interfere with them the democracy of the north was determined to adopt a platform in which douglas's doctrine of popular sovereignty was the central plank the time had been when the south had been thoroughly satisfied with the douglas theory that it was not so now was due largely to lincoln 
he had discovered that douglas in presenting his attractive dogma that the people of the state should be left to regulate their domestic concerns in their own way subject only to the constitution gave one interpretation in the south another in the north knowing that illinois would never consent to the doctrine as the south understood it nor the south to the northern notion lincoln forced douglas in eighteen fifty eight in a debate at freeport illinois to explain his meaning illinois was satisfied with the explanation but the south saw the deceit from the day of the freeport debate douglas's power in the south declined when the charleston convention met the southern democrats were fully determined to defeat the man who had so nearly persuaded them to a doctrine which he interpreted according to the prejudices of the section in which he spoke when a douglas platform was adopted by the convention they withdrew the upshot of this secession was that the two factions called fresh conventions to meet in baltimore in june there the northern democracy nominated as its candidates douglas and johnson a few days later the southern democrats named breckinridge and lane thus when lincoln was nominated his opponents were divided the opposition to him was still further weakened by the appearance of a sporadic party the constitutional union which in a vague and general platform shirked the very precise and vital question at issue and declared finally for the constitution of the country the union of the states and the enforcement of the laws this party nominated bell and everett known as the kangaroo ticket because the hind part was the stronger the tables were in his favor if his own party stood by him he felt sure of his election there was every sign that it would so far as i can learn he wrote his friend washburn a few days after the convention the nominations start well everywhere and if they get no back set it would seem as if they were going through the start of the nominations had in fact been very good nothing more jubilant could have been conceived than the reception given lincoln's name in the northwest there won't be a tar-barrel left in illinois to-night said douglas in washington to his senatorial friends who asked him when the news of the nomination reached them who is this man lincoln anyhow douglas was right not only the tar-barrels but half the fences of the state went up in the fire of rejoicing the demonstrations in the middle states and in the east were hardly less exultant there was a striking difference in them however in the northwest it was the candidate in the rest of the country the platform and the probability of its success which inspired the popular outbursts and this was inevitable so little was lincoln known outside of his own part of the country the orators at the ratification meetings of the east found it necessary to look up his history to tell their audiences who he was the newspapers printed biographical sketches and very meagre ones they were for up to this time almost no details of his life had been published these facts filled many a serious-minded republican with dismay to them there seemed but one explanation for the choice of lincoln over the heads of so many more experienced and distinguished men it had been a political trick born of the sentiment anything to beat seward i remember says a republican of eighteen sixty that when i first read the news on a bulletin board as i came down street in philadelphia that i experienced a moment of intense physical pain it was as though someone had dealt me a heavy blow over the head then my strength failed me i believed our cause was doomed the opposition press found in lincoln's obscurity abundant editorial material he was a third-rate country lawyer poorer even than poor pierce said the new york herald of course he would be a nullity if he were elected how could a man be otherwise who had never done anything but deliver a few lectures and get himself beaten by douglas in the campaign of fifty eight they hooted at his coarse and clumsy jokes declared that he could not speak good grammar and that all he was really distinguished for was rail splitting running a broad horn and bearing the sobriquet of honest old abe the snobbishness of the country came out in full he was not a gentleman that is 
He did not know how to wear clothes, perhaps sat at times in shirt sleeves, tilted back his chair. He could quote neither Latin nor Greek, had never traveled, had no pedigree. The Republican press took up the gauntlet. To the charge that he would be a nullity, the Tribune replied, A man who by his own genius and force of character has raised himself from being a penniless and uneducated flatboatman on the Wabash River to the position Mr. Lincoln now occupies is not likely to be a nullity anywhere. And Bryant answered all the sneering by a noble editorial in which he claimed Mr. Lincoln to be a real representative man. Nevertheless, the eagerness with which the Republican press hastened to show that Lincoln was not the coarse backwoodsman the Democrats painted him showed how much they winced under the charges. Reporters were sent west to describe his home, his family, and his habits in order to prove that he did not live in low Hoosier style. They told with great satisfaction that he wore daily a broadcloth suit, almost elegant. They described his modest home as a mansion and an elegant two-story dwelling, and they never failed to note that Mrs. Lincoln spoke French fluently, and that he had a son in Harvard College. When they could, with reasonable certainty, connect him with the Lincolns of Hingham, Massachusetts, they heralded his good blood with pride, and marshaled the Lincolns who had distinguished themselves in the history of the country. Among the common people, the jeers that Lincoln was but a rail-splitter was a spur to enthusiasm. Too many of the solid men of the North had swung an axe. Too many of them had passed from log-hut to mansion, not to blaze with sympathetic indignation when the party was taunted with nominating a backwoodsman. The rail became their emblem and their rallying cry and the story of the rail fence Lincoln had built, a feature of every campaign speech and every country store discussion. In a week after his nomination, two rails declared to have been split by Lincoln were on exhibition in New York, and certain zealous Pennsylvanians had sent to Macon, Illinois, asking to buy the whole fence and have it shipped east. It was the rail which decorated campaign medals, inspired campaign songs, appeared in campaign cartoons. There was something more than a desire to stand by the candidate in the enthusiasm. At bottom, it was a popular vindication of the American way of making a man. More important to Lincoln than any popular enthusiasm was the ratification given his nomination by the rival candidates. What would they do? The whole party held its breath until Seward was heard from. No man could have taken a crushing defeat more nobly. He was at his home in Auburn, New York, on May 18th, the day of the nomination, and when the news of Lincoln's success was brought him, his informer told him that there was not a Republican to be found in town who had the heart left to write an editorial for the Daily Advertiser approving the nomination. Seward smilingly took his pen and wrote the following paragraph, which appeared that evening. No truer exposition of the Republican creed could be given than the platform adopted by the convention contains. No truer or firmer defenders of the Republican faith could have been found in the Union than the distinguished and esteemed citizens on whom the honors of the nomination have fallen. Their election, we trust by a decisive majority, will restore the government of the U.S. to its constitutional and ancient course. Let the watchword of the Republican Party be union and liberty, and onward to victory. A few days later, Seward went to Washington, where a number of disappointed and rebellious Republicans called upon him to offer their condolence. Mr. Seward, they said, we cannot accept this situation. We want you to bolt the nomination and run on an independent ticket. Mr. Seward smiled. Gentlemen, he said, your zeal outruns your discretion. There are many of you giving this advice now, say perhaps three hundred. Two weeks hence there would be one hundred and fifty, and the next week fifty. After that, only William H. Seward. No, gentlemen, the Republican Party was not made for William H. Seward, but Mr. Seward, if he is worth anything, for the Republican Party, and I believe I have still work to do. I must therefore decline to accept your advice. I have had some experience of this kind. 
i ran once as a candidate for the nomination to the governorship of new york i was defeated my friends wanted me to bolt and run independently but i declined my opponent who had received the nomination was defeated in the election i would have been defeated another year i did receive the nomination and i was elected but if i had consented in the first place to bolt the regular nominee i would never have received the nomination regularly a second time and so would never have been governor of new york seward wrote lincoln very soon congratulating him and promising support so did the other leading rivals the letters were grateful to lincoln holding myself the humblest of all those whose names were before the convention he wrote chase i feel in special need of the assistance of all and i am glad very glad of the indication that you stand ready with these congratulations and promises of support from his rivals came others from men not less known joshua giddings wrote lincoln an admirable letter on may nineteenth dear lincoln you are nominated you will be elected after your election thousands will crowd around you claiming rewards for services rendered i too have my claims upon you i have not worked for your nomination nor for that of any other man i have labored for the establishment of principles and when men came to me asking my opinion of you i only told them lincoln is an honest man all i ask of you in return for my services is make my statement good through your administration yours giddings lincoln soon saw that not only the strong men of his party were supporting him but that they were working harmoniously in an excellent organization the republicans all agreed with the tribune that the election of mr lincoln though it could not be accomplished without work was eminently a thing that could be done and they set themselves vigorously to do it as the party was composed largely of young men who felt that the cause was worthy of their best efforts great zest and ingenuity was thrown into the campaigning arrangements were immediately made for a systematic stumping of the whole country the speakers engaged were of a very high order among them being sumner seward chase cassius m clay greeley stevens many of the speeches were of more than usual dramatic interest such was sumner's great speech at cooper institute july eleventh on the origin necessity and permanence of the republican party it was the first speech Sumner had made in public since the attack on him in the Senate in 1856, and attracted immense attention. Seward made a five weeks trip through the West, often speaking several times a day. No one worked harder than Charles Schurz. I began speaking shortly after the convention, Mr. Schurz once told the author, and continued until the day of the election, making from one to three speeches with the exception of about ten days in September when I was so fatigued that I had to stop for a little while. I spoke in both English and German, under the auspices of the National Committee, and not only in the larger towns, but frequently also in country districts. No speaker of the campaign touched the people more deeply. Young, ardent, aspiring, said the New York Evening Post, in speaking of Mr. Schertz, the romances connected with his life and escape from his fatherland his scholarly attainments and above all his devotion to the principles which cast him an exile on our shores have all combined to render him dear to the hearts of his countrymen and to place him in the foremost rank of their leaders beside this educational work on the stump was that by pamphlets after the campaign lives of lincoln and hamlin of which there were many the campaign tracts issued by the tribune were the most widely circulated documents there were several of these the most popular being carl schurz's speech on the doom of slavery and seward's on the irrepressible conflict there was at the same time of course an immense amount done in the press and much of it by the ablest literary men the united states has produced thus lowell wrote essays for the atlantic whittier verses for the tribune and the atlantic bryant greeley raymond bowles editorials for their journals the republican campaign of eighteen sixty had one distinguishing feature the wide awakes 
bands of torch-bearers who in a simple uniform of glazed cap and cape and carrying colored lanterns or blazing coal-oil torches paraded the streets of almost every town of the north throughout the summer and fall arousing everywhere the wildest enthusiasm their origin was purely accidental in february cassius m clay spoke in hartford connecticut a few ardent young republicans accompanied him as a kind of bodyguard and to save their garments from the dripping of the torches a few of them wore improvised capes of black glazed cambric the uniform attracted so much attention that a campaign club formed in hartford soon after adopted it the club called itself the wide awakes other clubs took up the idea and soon there were wide awakes drilling regularly from one end of the north to the other a great many fantastic movements were invented by them a favorite one being a peculiar zigzag march an imitation of the party emblem the rail fence numbers of the clubs adopted the rules and drills of the chicago zouaves one of the most popular military organizations of the day in the summer of eighteen sixty colonel ellsworth the commanding officer of the zouaves brought them east the wide awake movement was greatly stimulated by this tour of the zouaves almost all of the clubs had their peculiar badges lincoln splitting rails or engineering a flatboat being a favorite decoration for them there were many medals worn as well many of these combined business and politics adroitly the obverse advising you to vote for the rail splitter the reverse to buy somebody's soap or tea or wagons many of the clubs owned lincoln rails which were given the place of honor on all public occasion and the originals as the hartford wide awakes were called possessed the identical mall with which lincoln had split the rails for the famous fence it had been secured in illinois together with such weighty credentials that nobody could dispute its claim and was the pride of the club it is still to be seen in hartford occupying a conspicuous place in the collection of the connecticut historical society campaign songs set to familiar airs were heard on every hand many of these never had more than a local vogue but others were sung generally one of the most ringing was e c stedman's honest abe of the west sung to the air of star-spangled banner then on to the holy republican strife and again for a future as fair as the morning for the sake of that freedom more precious than life ring out the grand anthem of liberty's warning lift the banner on high while from mountain and plain the cheers of the people are sounded again hurrah for our cause of all causes the best hurrah for old abe honest abe of the west one of the campaign songs which will never be forgotten was whittier's the quakers are out give the flags to the winds set the hills all aflame make way for the man with the patriarch's name away with misgivings away with all doubt for lincoln goes in when the quakers are out in many of the states great rallies were held at central points at which scores of wide awake clubs and a dozen popular speakers were present the most enthusiastic of all these was held in mr lincoln's own home springfield on august eighth fully seventy five thousand people gathered for the celebration by far the greater number coming across the prairies on horseback or in wagons a procession eight miles long filed by mr lincoln's door mr e b washburn who was with mr lincoln in springfield that day says of this mass meeting it was one of the most enormous and impressive gatherings i had ever witnessed mr lincoln surrounded by some intimate friends sat on the balcony of his humble home it took hours for all the delegations to file before him and there was no token of enthusiasm wanting he was deeply touched by the manifestations of personal and political friendships and returned all his salutations in that off-hand and kindly manner which belonged to him i know of no demonstration of a similar character that can compare with it except the review by napoleon of his army for the invasion of russia about the same season of the year in eighteen twelve end of section twenty two
Section 23 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. The Campaign of 1860. Part 2. From May until November, this work for the ticket went on steadily and ardently. Mr. Lincoln, during all this time, remained quietly in Springfield. The conspicuous position in which he was placed made almost no difference in his simple life. He was the same genial, accessible, modest man as ever. His habits is unpretentious. His friendliness is great. The chief outward change in his daily round was merely one of quarters. It seemed to his friends that neither his home nor his dingy law office was an appropriate place in which to receive his visitors, and they arranged that a room in the state house, which stood on the village green in the center of the town, be put at his disposal. He came down to this office every morning about eight o'clock, always stopping on his way in his old cordial fashion to ask the news or exchange a story when he met an acquaintance. Frequently he went to the post office himself before going to his office, and came out his arms loaded with letters and papers. He had no regular hours for visitors. There was no ceremony for admittance to his presence. People came when they would. Usually they found the door open. If it was not, it was Mr. Lincoln's own voice which answered, Come in, to their knock. These visitors were a strange medley of the curious, the interested, and the friendly. Many came simply to see him, to say they had shaken hands with him, numbers to try to find out what his policy would be if elected, others to wish him success. All day long they filed in and out, leaving him some days no time for his correspondence, which every day grew larger. He seemed never to be in a hurry, never to lose patience, however high his table was plied with mail, however closely his room was crowded with visitors. He even found time to give frequent sittings to the artists sent from various places of the country to paint his portrait. Among those who came in the summer after the nomination were Barry of Boston, Hicks of New York, Conant of St. Louis, Wright of Mobile, Brown and Atwood of Philadelphia, Jones of Cincinnati. Mr. Lincoln took the kindliest interest in these men, and later, when president, did more than one of them a friendly turn. Thus in March, 1865, he wrote to Seward in regard to Jones and Piat that he had some wish that they might have some of those moderate-sized consulates which facilitate artists a little in their profession. They, in their turn, never forgot him. Sitting over their easels by the hour in the corner of his office assigned them, they got many glimpses into the man's great heart, and nowhere do we get pleasanter pictures of Mr. Lincoln in this period than from their journals. To those who observed Mr. Lincoln closely as he received his visitors, one thing was apparent. He always remained master of the interview. While his visitors told him a great deal, they learned nothing from him which he did not wish to give. The following observations, published in the Illinois State Journal in November 1860, illustrate very well what happened almost every day in his office. While talking to two or three gentlemen and standing up, a very hard-looking customer rolled in and tumbled into the only vacant chair and the one lately occupied by Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln's keen eye took in the fact, but gave no evidence of the notice. Turning around at last, he spoke to the odd specimen, holding out his hand at such a distance that our friend had to vacate the chair if he accepted the proffered shake. Mr. Lincoln quietly resumed his chair. It was a small matter, yet one giving proof more positively than a larger event of that peculiar way the man has of mingling with a mixed crowd. He converses fluently on all subjects, illustrates everything by a merry anecdote, of which article he has an abundant supply. I said on all subjects. He does not talk politics. He passes from that gracefully the moment it is introduced. Hundreds seek him every week to get his opinion on this or that subject. He has a jolly way of disposing of that matter by saying, Ah, you haven't read my speeches. Let me make you a present of my speeches. And the earnest inquirer finds himself the happy possessor of some old documents. Among his daily visitors, there were usually men of eminence from north and south. 
he received them all with perfect simplicity and always even on his busiest days found a moment to turn away from them to greet old friends who had known him when he kept grocery in new salem or acted as deputy surveyor of sangamon county one day as he talked to a company of distinguished strangers an old lady in a big sunbonnet heavy boots and short skirts walked into the office she carried a package wrapped in brown paper and tied with a white string as soon as mr lincoln saw her he left the group went to meet her and shaking her hand cordially inquired for her folks after a moment the old lady opened her package and taking out a pair of coarse wool socks she handed them to him i wanted to give you something mr lincoln she said to take to washington and that's all i had i spun that yarn and knit them socks myself thanking her warmly mr lincoln took the socks and holding them up by the toes one in each hand he turned to the astonished celebrities and said in a voice full of kindly amusement the lady got my latitude and longitude about right didn't she gentlemen the old lady was not the only one however who gave mr lincoln something to carry to washington from the time of his nomination gifts poured in on him many of these came in the form of wearing apparel mr george lincoln of brooklyn who in january carried a handsome silk hat to the president-elect the gift of a new york hatter says that in receiving the hat mr lincoln laughed heartily over the gifts of clothing and remarked to mrs lincoln well wife if nothing else comes out of this scrape we are going to have some new clothes are we not to those who observed mr lincoln superficially in this period it might have seemed that he was doing nothing of any value to himself or to his party certainly he was taking no active part in the campaign he was making no speeches writing no letters giving no interviews this policy of silence he had adopted at the outset the very night of his nomination his townspeople in serenading him had called for a speech standing in the doorway of his house he said to them that he did not suppose the honor of such a visit was intended particularly for himself as a private citizen but rather as the representative of a great party that as to his position on the political questions of the day he could only refer them to his previous speeches and added fellow citizens and friends the time comes upon every public man when it is best for him to keep his lips closed that time has come upon me when in august the monster mass meeting was held in springfield every effort was made to persuade mr lincoln to speak all he would consent to do was to appear and in a few words excuse himself up to the time he left for washington to be inaugurated he kept his resolve nor would he write letters explaining his position or defending himself so many letters were received asking his political opinion that he found it necessary soon after his nomination to prepare the following form of reply to be sent out by his secretary dear sir your letter to mr lincoln of blank and by which you seek to obtain his opinions on certain political points has been received by him he has received others of a similar character but he also has a greater number of the exactly opposite character the latter class beseech him to write nothing whatever on any point of political doctrine they say his positions were well known when he was nominated and that he must not now embarrass the canvas by undertaking to shift or modify them he regrets that he cannot oblige all but you perceive it is impossible for him to do so yours etc john g nicolay to one gentleman who asked him to write something disclaiming all intention to interfere with slaves or slavery in the states he replied i have already done this many many times and it is in print and open to all who will read those who will not read or heed what i have already publicly said would not read or heed a repetition of it if they hear not moses and the prophets neither will they be persuaded through one rose from the dead and to another correspondent who suggested he set forth his conservative views he wrote i will not forbear from doing so merely on punctilio and pluck if i do finally abstain it will be because of apprehension that it would do harm for the good men of the south and i regard the majority of them as such i have no objection to repeat seventy and seven times 
but i have bad men to deal with both north and south men who are eager for something new upon which to base new representations men who would like to frighten me or at least to fix upon me the character of timidity and cowardice they would seize upon almost any letter i could write as being an awful coming down i intend keeping my eye upon these gentlemen and to not unnecessarily put any weapons in their hands nor would he defend himself against the campaign stories which appeared in numbers one of which his enemies made much was that he had received two hundred dollars for the cooper union speech in february eighteen sixty they claimed that as it was a political speech it was contrary to political etiquette to accept pay lincoln explained the affair in a letter to a gentleman who had been disturbed by it and added i have made this explanation to you as a friend but i wish no explanation made to our enemies what they want is a squabble and a fuss and they can have that if we explain and they cannot have it if we don't another foolish tale which caused lincoln's partisans unrest was that when he was a member of congress he had charged several pairs of boots to his stationery account and that they had been paid for out of public funds one of lincoln's friends took the trouble to examine the stationery account for the thirtieth congress and to publish a certified denial of the story lincoln's silence and inactivity were merely external as a matter of fact no one was busier than he no one was following more intently and thoughtfully the gradual development of the situation and the daily fluctuation of opinion by correspondence from the press through his visitors many of whom came to springfield at his request he kept himself informed of how the campaign was going from maine to california whenever he feared a break in the ranks he put in a word of warning or of advice he warned thurlow weed that douglas was managing the bell element with great adroitness he cautioned hannibal hamlin against a break the latter feared in maine such a result as you seem to predict in maine he wrote would i fear put us on the downhill track lose us the state elections in pennsylvania and indiana and probably ruin us on the main turn in november while he gave the strictest attention to the progress of the elections all over the country he managed to keep above local issues and to hold himself aloof from the personal contests and rivalries within the party in fact lincoln kept in perfect touch with the progress of his party from may to november and was able to say at any time with accuracy just what his chances were in each state he seems at no time to have had any serious fear that he would be defeated there was a tragic side to this very certainty of election which lincoln felt deeply in the convention which had nominated him nine states of the union had not been represented if he should be elected these states would have no voice in his choice he knew that he was pledged to a platform whose principles these states stigmatized as deception and fraud and that if elected he must deny what they claimed as rights he knew that in at least one state alabama the legislature two months before his nomination had pledged itself by an almost unanimous vote in case of his election to call a convention to consider what should be done for the protection of their rights interests and honor he knew that numbers of influential southern men were repeating daily with william l yancey i want the cotton states precipitated in a revolution or declaring with mr crawford of georgia we will never submit to the inauguration of a black republican president from may to november he watched anxiously for every sign that the south was preparing to make good the threats with which its orators were inflaming their audiences which a hostile press reiterated day by day which teemed in his mail and which brought scores of timorous men to springfield to advise and warn him how serious was it all he did his utmost to discover even writing in october to major david hunter to find out how much truth there was in the report of disaffection in a western fort i have a letter from a writer unknown to me he said saying that the officers of the army at fort kearney have determined 
in case of republican success at the approaching presidential election to take themselves and the arms at that point south for the purpose of resistance to the government while i think there are many chances to one that this is a humbug it occurs to me that any real movement of this sort in the army would leak out and become known to you in such case if it would not be unprofessional or dishonorable of which you are to be the judge i shall be much obliged if you will apprise me of it in spite of all that lincoln knew of the temper of the south in spite of his close study of events there through the summer of eighteen sixty he did not believe secession probable the people of the south have too much good sense and good temper to attempt the ruin of the government rather than see it administered as it was administered by the men who made it at least so i hope and believe he wrote a correspondent in august and in september he said to a visitor there are no real disunionists in the country there were reasons for this confidence in every state of the south there was a union party working to meet the crisis which lincoln's election was sure to produce many of the members sent him cheering letters in acknowledging such a letter in august lincoln wrote it contains one of the many assurances i receive from the south that in no probable event will there be any very formidable effort to break up the union then too lincoln had heard this threat of secession for so long that he had grown slightly indifferent to it he remembered that in the fremont campaign it had been employed with even more violence than now again in eighteen fifty eight the clamor of disunion had risen he believed that now much of the noise about disunion was merely political raised by the friends of breckinridge or douglas or bell to drive voters from him the leading men of the party sustained lincoln in this belief seward and schurz both confidently assured republicans in their speeches that they might vote for lincoln without fear and bryant in the evening post laughed at the conservative distresses of those who supposed that lincoln's election would cause secession and war reminding them that when jefferson was a candidate it was said his election would let loose the floodgates of french jacobinism and that henry clay had declared that nothing short of universal commercial ruin would follow jackson's election lincoln was sustained not only by the assurances of the union party of the south and by the buoyant hopefulness of the republicans of the north he had a powerful moral support in his own conviction that no matter what effort the south made to secede the north could and would prevent it he was and had been for years perfectly clear on this subject in the fremont campaign he had said in reply to the threat of disunion no matter what our grievance even though kansas shall come in as a slave state and no matter what theirs even if we shall restore the compromise we will say to the southern disunionists we won't go out of the union and you shan't it was then with the belief that he was going to be elected and that while his election would produce a serious uproar in the south that no successful resistance would follow that lincoln approached election day he had grown materially in the estimation of the country in the interval between may and november many of the leading men of his party who had deplored his nomination had come to believe him a wise strong man those who sought personal interviews with him and they were many went home feeling like thurlow weed who heartsick over seward's defeat and full of distrust not to say contempt of lincoln's ability visited him soon after the nomination at the earnest request of david davis and leonard sweat i found mr lincoln wrote weed afterward sagacious and practical he displayed throughout the conversation so much good sense such intuitive knowledge of human nature and such familiarity with the virtues and infirmities of politicians that i became impressed very favorably with his fitness for the duties with which he was not unlikely to be called upon to discharge this conversation lasted some five hours and when the train arrived in which we were to depart i rose all the better prepared to go to work with a will in favor of mr lincoln's election as the interview had inspired me with confidence in his capacity and integrity 
in the very south where fury of prejudice had burst and where as was to be expected lincoln was popularly regarded as an odious and tyrannical monster much as later the north regarded jefferson davis there were signs that he was at least considered honest in his views it may seem strange to you wrote a kentuckian who was quoted by the new york evening post august seventeenth eighteen sixty but it is nevertheless true that the south looks for the election of lincoln by the people and would prefer him to douglas our most ultra southern men seem to respect him and to have confidence in his honesty fairness and conservatism they concede that he stands on a moderate platform that his antecedents are excellent and that he is not likely to invade the rights of any one but they can't go for him because he holds opinions relative to the rights of slavery in the territories directly opposite to the southern view still he is an open and candid opponent and therefore commands southern respect some of the most interesting interviews which mr lincoln has had wrote someone to the baltimore patriot have been with extreme southern gentlemen who came full of prejudice against him and who left satisfied with his loyalty to all the constitutional rights of the south i could tell you of some of the most interesting cases but it is enough to know that the general sentiment of all southern men who have conversed with him is the same as that publicly expressed by mr goggin of virginia mr perry of south carolina mr mccray of north carolina and many others who have not hesitated to avow their intention of accepting mr lincoln's election and holding him to the constitutional discharge of the presidential office the most significant element in the estimate of lincoln which the country formed between may and november was the respect and affection which was awakened among the common people there sprang up all over the country among plain people a feeling for him not unlike that which had long existed in illinois the general distribution made of his speeches had something to do with this there was published in eighteen sixty in columbus ohio an edition of the lincoln and douglas debates of eighteen fifty eight which was used freely as a campaign document lincoln himself gave away scores of these books to his friends and to persons who came to him begging for an expression of his views Today, copies bearing his autograph are to be seen treasured volumes in the libraries of many public men the cooper union speech was published by the young men's republican club of new york and circulated widely to the hard-working farmer mechanic storekeeper who thought slowly but surely and whose sole political ambition was to cast an honest vote these speeches were like a personal face-to-face -face talk the argument was so clear the illustration so persuasive the statement so colloquial and natural that they could not get away from them lincoln's right was the general verdict among masses of people who hesitating between republicanism and popular sovereignty read the speeches as a help to a decision while lincoln's speeches awakened respect for and confidence in his ability the story of his life stirred something deeper in men here was a man who had become a leader of the nation by the labor of his hands the honesty of his intellect the uprightness of his heart plain people were touched by the hardships of this life so like their own inspired by the thought that a man who had struggled as they had done who had remained poor who had lived simply could be eligible to the highest place in the nation they had believed that it could be done here was a proof of it they told the story to their boys this they said is what american institutions make possible not glitter or wealth trickery or demagogy are necessary only honesty hard thinking a fixed purpose affection and sympathy for lincoln grew with respect it was the beginning of that peculiar sympathetic relation between him and the common people which was to become one of the controlling influences in the great drama of the civil war election day in eighteen sixty fell on the sixth springfield although a town of strong democratic sympathy realized the importance of the occasion and by daylight was booming away with cannon before noon numbers of bands which came the citizens hardly knew from where were playing on the corners of every street 
mr lincoln as was his custom came down to his room at the state house by eight o'clock where he went over his big mail as coolly as if it were not election day and he a candidate for the presidency of the united states he had not been there long before his friends began to flock in in such numbers that it was proposed that the doors be closed and he be allowed to remain by himself but he said he had never done such a thing in his life as to close the door on his friends and that he did not intend to begin now and so the day wore away in the entertainment of visitors it had not been mr lincoln's intention to vote the obstacle which he found in the way being that his own name headed the republican ticket and that he did not want to vote for himself one of his friends suggested that his name might be cut off and he vote for the rest of the ticket he fell in with this suggestion and late in the afternoon when the crowd around the poles which were just across the street from his office had subsided somewhat he went over to cast his ballot he was recognized immediately and his friends were soon about him cheering wildly and contending good-naturedly for the opportunity to shake his hand even the democrats with their hands full of documents which they were distributing joined in this enthusiastic demonstration and cheered at the top of their voices for their beloved townsmen no returns were expected before seven o'clock and it was a little later than that when mr lincoln returned from his supper to the state house the first dispatches that came were from different parts of illinois the very first being from decatur where a republican gain was announced soon after alton which was expected to go for douglas sent in a majority of twelve for lincoln there was a tremendous sensation in the company and mr lincoln asked that the dispatch be sent out to the boys meaning the crowd which had gathered in and about the state house after an hour or more news began to come from missouri now said mr lincoln they should get a few licks back at us but to everybody's surprise there was more good news from missouri than had been expected towards midnight news began to come in from pennsylvania allegheny county ten thousand majority for lincoln philadelphia fifteen thousand plurality five thousand majority overall then a telegram from simon cameron pennsylvania seventy thousand for you new york safe glory enough this was the first news from new york and since ten o'clock the company had been waiting impatiently for it a fusion ticket it was feared might go through there and if it did the disaster to the republicans would be serious while waiting anxiously for something definite from new york a delegation of springfield ladies came in to invite mr lincoln and his friends to a hall nearby where they had prepared refreshments for all the republican politicians of the town the party had not been there long before there came a telegram announcing that new york city had gone republican such a cheering was probably never heard in springfield before the hall full of people beside themselves with joy began a romping promenade around the tables singing at the top of their voices the popular campaign song oh ain't you glad you joined the republicans here at intervals further telegrams came from new york all announcing large majorities the scene became one of the wildest excitement and mr lincoln and his friends soon withdrew to a little telegraph office on the square where they could receive reports more quietly up to this time the only anxiety mr lincoln had shown about the election was in the returns from his state and town he didn't feel quite easy as he said about springfield towards morning however the announcement came that he had a majority in his own precinct then it was that he showed the first emotion a jubilant chuckle and soon after remarked cheerfully to his friends that he guessed he'd go home now which he did but springfield was not content to go home cannon banged until daylight and on every street corner and in every alley could be heard groups of men shouting at the tops of their voices oh ain't you glad you joined the republicans Twenty-four hours later, and the full result of that Tuesday's work was known. Out of 303 electoral votes, Lincoln had received 180. Of the popular vote, he had received 1,866,452, nearly half a million over Douglas, a million over Breckinridge, a million and a quarter over Bell. It was a victory, 
but there were facts about the victory which startled the thoughtful. If Lincoln had more votes than any one opposing candidate, they together had nearly one million over him. Fifteen states of the Union gave him no electoral votes, and in ten states he had not received a single popular vote. End of section 23 Section 24 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Mr. Lincoln is President-Elect. Part 1. Although the election of November 6th made Lincoln the President-Elect of the United States, for four months he could exercise no direct influence on the affairs of the country. If the South tried to make good her threat to secede in case he was elected, he could do nothing to restrain her. The South did try, and at once. With the very election returns, the telegraph brought Lincoln news of disruption. Day by day this news continued, and always more alarming. On November 10th, the United States Senators from South Carolina resigned. Six weeks later, that state passed an ordinance of secession and began to organize an independent government. By the end of December, the only remnant of United States authority in South Carolina was the small garrison commanded by Major Anderson, which occupied Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. The remaining forts and batteries of that harbor, the lighthouse tender, the arsenal, the post office, the custom house, in short, everything in the states over which the stars and stripes had floated was under the palmetto flag. In his quiet office in Springfield, Mr. Lincoln read in January reports of the proceedings of conventions in Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana, by all of which states, in that month, ordinances of secession were adopted. In February, he saw representatives of these same states unite in a general convention at Montgomery, Alabama, and the newspapers told him how promptly and intelligently they went to work to found a new nation, the Southern Confederacy, to provide it with a constitution and to give it officers. Mr. Lincoln observed that each state, as she went out of the Union, prepared to defend her course if necessary. On November 18th, Georgia appropriated $1 million to arm the state, and in January she seized Forts Pulaski and Jackson, and the United States Arsenal. Louisiana appropriated all the federal property in her borders, even to the mint and custom house and the money they contained. Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi were not behind in their seizures, and when the new government was formed at Montgomery, it promptly took up the question of defending its life. Mr. Lincoln was not only obliged to sit inactive and watch this steady dissolution of the Union, but he was obliged to see what was still harder, that the administration which he was to succeed was doing nothing to check the destructionists. Indeed, all through this period, proof accumulated that members of Mr. Buchanan's cabinet had been systematically working for many months to disarm the North and equip the South. The quantity of arms sent quietly from northern arsenals was so great that the citizens of the towns from which they went became alarmed. Thus, the Springfield Republican of January 2, 1861, noted that the citizens of that town were growing excited over the procession of government licenses which, during the last spring and summer, and also quite recently, have been engaged in transporting from the United States Armory to the United States Freight Station an immense quantity of boxes of muskets marked for southern distribution. We find, the paper continues, that in 1860 there were removed for safekeeping in other arsenals 135,430 government arms. This has nothing to do with the distribution occasionally made for state militia. And when in December the citizens of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, found that 123 cannon had been ordered south from the arsenal there, they made such energetic protests that President Buchanan was obliged to countermand the order of his Secretary of War. The rapid disintegration which followed the election of Mr. Lincoln filled the North with dismay. 
there was a general demand for some compromise which would reassure the south and stop secession it was the place of the republicans the conservatives argued to make this compromise a furious clamor broke over mr lincoln's head his election had caused the trouble now what would he do to quell it how much of the republican platform would he give up among the newspapers which pleaded with the president-elect to do something to reassure the south the most able was the new york herald lincoln was a sectional president declared the herald who out of four million seven hundred thousand votes cast had received but one million eight hundred fifty thousand and whom the south had had no part in electing if mr lincoln intends to carry on the government according to the principles laid down in the chicago platform and the documents issued under the authority of the republican national committee the inevitable tendency of his administration will be to encourage servile insurrections and to make the southern states still more uncomfortable within the union than they could by any possibility be without it if the new president recognizes the fact that he is not bound by the chicago platform the people having repudiated it if he comes out and tells the people that he will govern the country according to the views of the majority and not to serve the purposes of the minority all may yet be well mr lincoln must throw his pledges to the winds let his party go to perdition in its own way and devote himself to the service of the whole country it is mr lincoln's bounden duty to come out now and declare his views it was not only the opposition press which urged lincoln to offer some kind of compromise many frightened republican newspapers added their influence the appeals of thousands of letters and of scores of visitors were added to the arguments of the press lincoln however refused to express his views anew i know the justness of my intentions he told an interviewer in november and the utter groundlessness of the pretended fears of the men who are filling the country with their clamor if i go into the presidency they will find me as i am on record nothing less nothing more my declarations have been made to the world without reservation they have been often repeated and now self-respect demands of me and of the party which has elected me that when threatened i should be silent business was brought almost to a standstill throughout the north by the prospect of disunion it is an awful time for merchants wrote a correspondent to charles sumner worse than in eighteen fifty seven and if there is not some speedy relief more than half of the best concerns in the country will be ruined numbers of prominent men urged the president-elect to say something conciliatory for the sake of trade his replies published in nicolay and hayes abraham lincoln are marked by spirit and decision to one man of wealth he wrote on november tenth i am not insensible to any commercial or financial depression that may exist but nothing is to be gained by fawning around the respectable scoundrels who got it up let them go to work and repair the mischief of their own making and then perhaps they will be less greedy to do the like again and to henry j raymond the editor of the new york times he gave on november twenty eighth in answer to a request for his views what he called a demonstration of the correctness of his judgment that he should say nothing for the public on the twentieth instant senator trumbull made a short speech which i suppose you have both seen and approved has a single newspaper heretofore against us urged that speech upon its readers with a purpose to quiet public anxiety not one so far as i know on the contrary the boston courier and its class hold me responsible for that speech and endeavor to inflame the north with the belief that it foreshadows an abandonment of republican ground by the incoming administration while the washington constitution and its class hold the same speech up to the south as an open declaration of war against them this is just as i expected and just what would happen with any declaration i could make these political fiends are not half sick enough yet party malice and not public good possesses them entirely they seek a sign and no sign shall be given them at least such is my present feeling and purpose 
while refusing positively to express himself for the general public at this time lincoln wrote and talked freely to the republican leaders almost all of whom were busy with one or another scheme for quieting the distracted nation on the opening of congress a committee of thirty-three had been appointed by the house to consider the present perilous condition of the country and the republican members wished to know what mr lincoln would yield the hon william kellogg the illinois member of the committee wrote to him his reply dated december eleventh is unmistakable entertain no proposition for a compromise in regard to the extension of slavery the instant you do they have us under again all our labor is lost and sooner or later must be done over douglas is sure to be again trying to bring in his popular sovereignty have none of it the tug has to come and better now than later you know i think the fugitive slave clause of the constitution ought to be enforced to put it in its mildest form ought not to be resisted while the committee of thirty-three was seeking grounds for a settlement in the house a committee of thirteen was busy in the senate in the same search on the latter committee was william h seward and he too sent to mr lincoln for a suggestion in reply the president-elect sent mr seward by thurlow weed a memorandum which was supposed to have been lost until a few months ago when it was discovered by mr frederick bancroft in course of his researches for a life of seward two points are covered in this memorandum the first that the fugitive slave law should be enforced the second that the federal union must be preserved in a letter to the hon e b washburn written on december thirteenth lincoln again stated his views on slavery extension prevent as far as possible any of our friends from demoralizing themselves and our cause by entertaining propositions for compromise of any sort on slavery extension there is no possible compromise upon it but which puts us under again and leaves all our work to do over again whether it be a missouri line or eli thayer's popular sovereignty it is all the same let either be done and immediately filibustering and extending slavery recommences on that point hold firm as with a chain of steel these counsels were given while secession was still in its infancy the alarming developments which followed did not cause lincoln to waver on january eleventh he wrote to the hon j t hale a letter published by nicolay and hay in which he said what is our present condition we have just carried an election on principles fairly stated to the people now we are told in advance the government shall be broken up unless we surrender to those we have beaten before we take the offices in this they are either attempting to play upon us or they are in dead earnest either way if we surrender it is the end of us and of the government they will repeat the experiment on us ad libitum a year will not pass till we shall have to take cuba as a condition upon which they will stay in the union they now have the constitution under which we have lived over seventy years and acts of congress of their own framing with no prospect of their being changed and they can never have a more shallow pretext for breaking up the government or extorting a compromise than now there is in my judgment but one compromise which would really settle the slavery question and that would be a prohibition against acquiring any more territory it was not the north and the republicans alone that appealed to mr lincoln the unionists of the south urged him for an explanation which they might present to the people as proof that there was nothing to fear from his election lincoln had no faith that any expression of his would be heeded yet he did confidentially express himself frankly to many southerners who came to him in springfield and there are two letters of his published by nicolay and hay which show how completely he grasped the essential difference between the north and the south and with what justice and kindness he put the case to those who disagreed with him the first of these letters was written to john a gilmer a member of congress from north carolina who desired earnestly to preserve the union but not unless the opinions of the south were considered mr gilmer had written to mr lincoln asking his position on certain questions lincoln replied 
Carefully read pages 18, 19, 74, 75, 88, 89, and 267 of the volume of joint debates between Senator Douglas and myself, with the Republican platform adopted at Chicago, and all your questions will be substantially answered. I have no thought of recommending the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, nor the slave trade among the slave states even on the conditions indicated and if i were to make such recommendation it is quite clear congress would not follow it as to employing slaves in arsenals and dockyards it is a thing i never thought of in my life to my recollection till i saw your letter and i may say of it precisely as i have said of the two points above as to the use of patronage in the slave states where there are few or no republicans i do not expect to inquire for the politics of the appointee or whether he does or not own slaves i intend in that matter to accommodate the people in the several localities if they themselves will allow me to accommodate them in one word i have never been am not now and probably never shall be in a mood of harassing the people either north or south on the territorial question i am inflexible as you see my position in the book on that there is a difference between you and us and it is the only substantial difference you think slavery is right and ought to be extended we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted for this neither has any just occasion to be angry with the other as to the state laws mentioned in your sixth question i really know very little of them i never have read one if any of them are in conflict with the fugitive slave clause or any other part of the constitution i certainly shall be glad of their repeal but i could hardly be justified as a citizen of illinois or as president of the united states to recommend the repeal of a statute of vermont or south carolina a week later mr lincoln wrote to a h stevens of georgia in reply to a note in which stevens had said the country is certainly in great peril, and no man ever had heavier or greater responsibilities resting upon him than you have in the present momentous crisis. I fully appreciate the present peril the country is in, and the weight of responsibility on me. Do the people of the South really entertain fears that a Republican administration would, directly or indirectly, interfere with the slaves or with them about the slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you, as once a friend, and still I hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fears. The South would be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of Washington. I suppose, however, this does not meet the case. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended, while we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. That, I suppose, is the rub. It certainly is the only substantial difference between us. The uproar which raged about Mr. Lincoln soon became quite as loud over coercion as over compromise. Each passing week made conciliation more difficult, saw new elements of disunion realized. What was to be done with the seceding states? What was to be done about the forts and arsenals, custom houses and post offices they were seizing? If Mr. Lincoln would not compromise, was he going to let the states and the federal property go, or was he going to compel them to return with it? Did he propose to coerce the South? Though the President-elect refused to give any expression of opinion on the subject to the country, it was not because he was not perfectly clear in his own mind. Secession he considered impossible. My opinion is, he wrote Thurlow Weed on December 17th, that no state can in any way lawfully get out of the Union without the consent of the others, and that it is the duty of the President and other government functionaries to run the machine as it is. When Horace Greeley began a series of editorials in the Tribune, contending that if seven or eight states sent agents to Washington saying, we want to get out of the Union, he should feel constrained by his devotion to human liberty to say let them go, Lincoln said nothing publicly, though in Springfield it was believed that he considered the policy dangerous and illogical. He certainly was only amused at Fernando Wood's scheme to take New York City out of the Union and make it a free city, another Hamburg. 
I reckon, he said to a New Yorker in February, in discussing the subject, that it will be some time before the front door sets up housekeeping on its own account. As to the forts and other federal property seized by the outgoing states, he seems to have felt from the first that they were to be retaken. In this matter, he sought guidance from Andrew Jackson. Less than a week after his election, a correspondent of the Evening Post found him engaged in reading the history of the nullifiers of 1832 and 1833, and of the summary way in which Old Hickory dealt with them. In December, he wrote to his friend E.B. Washburn, who had just reported to him an interview with General Scott, the commander-in-chief of the Army, on the dangers of the situation. "'Please present my respects to the General, and tell him, confidentially, that I shall be obliged to him to be as well prepared as he can to either hold or retake the forts, as the case may require, at and after the inauguration.' And the very next day, he wrote to Major David Hunter, the most we can do now is to watch events and be as well prepared as possible for any turn things may take. If the forts fall, my judgment is that they are to be retaken. From the foregoing letters it will be seen that Mr. Lincoln had stripped his opinions on the questions of the day of all verbiage and non-essentials, and reduced them to the following simple propositions. 1. Slavery is wrong and must not be extended. 2 entertain no proposition for a compromise in regard to the extension of slavery. 3. No state can, in any way, lawfully get out of the Union without the consent of the others. It is the duty of the President and other government functionaries to run the machine as it is. 4. If the forts fall, my judgment is that they are to be retaken. To these simple statements he stuck throughout this period of confusion and distress, refusing to allow them to be obscured by words and passion, and making them his guide in the work of preparation for his inauguration. Three things especially occupied him in this preparation. 1. Making the acquaintance of the men with whom he was to be associated in the administration. 2. His cabinet. 3. His inaugural address. The first letter Lincoln wrote after his election was to Hannibal Hamlin, the vice president-elect, asking for an interview. The two gentlemen met at the Tremont House, Chicago, on November 23rd. Mr. Hamlin once gave to a friend, Mr. C.J. Prescott of New York, an account of this meeting, which Mr. Prescott has written out for this work. Mr. Hamlin was, for many years, a member of the Board of Trustees of Waterville College, now Colby University, Waterville, Maine. On one of the annual commencement occasions, I found him, one afternoon, seated on the piazza of the Elmwood, for the moment alone and unoccupied. Taking a chair by his side, I said, Mr. Hamlin, when did you first meet Mr. Lincoln? Well, said he, I very plainly recall the circumstances of our first meeting. It was in Chicago. Sometime before the inauguration, I received a letter from Mr. Lincoln, asking me to see him before I went to Washington. So I went to Chicago, where I was to meet Mr. Lincoln. Sending my card to Mr. Lincoln's room, I received word to come right up. I found the door open, and Mr. Lincoln approaching with extended hand. With a hearty welcome, he said, I think I have never met you before, Mr. Hamlin, but this is not the first time I have seen you. I have just been recalling the time when, in 48, I went to the Senate to hear you speak. Your subject was not new, but the ideas were sound. You were talking about slavery, and I now take occasion to thank you for so well expressing what were my own sentiments at that time. Well, Mr. President, said I, this is certainly quite a remarkable coincidence. I myself have just been recalling the first time I ever saw you. It must have been about the same time to which you allude. I was passing through the house and was attracted by some remarks on the subject of slavery from one of the new members. They told me it was Lincoln, of Illinois. I heard you through, and I very well remember how heartily I endorsed every point you made. And, Mr. President, I have no doubt we are still in perfect accord on the main question." The result of the Chicago interview was a cordial understanding between the two men, which lasted throughout their administration. 
this was to be expected for they were not unlike in character and experience the same kind of democratic feeling inspired their relations with others both marched with the boys both were eminently companionable hamlin liked a good story as well as lincoln and told almost as many he had too the same quaint way of putting things like lincoln hamlin had been born poor and had had a hand-to-hand -hand struggle to get up in the world he had worked on a farm chopped logs taught school studied law at night in short turned his hand cheerfully and eagerly to anything that would help him realize his ambitions like lincoln he had gone early into politics and like lincoln again he had revolted from his party in eighteen fifty six to join the republicans a great many men were summoned to springfield by lincoln in order that he might learn their views more perfectly among those who came either by his direct or indirect invitation were edward bates thurlow weed david wilmot a k mcclure george w julian e d baker william sweeney horace greeley and carl schurz with many of them lincoln did not hesitate to talk over his cabinet thurlow weed says that when he visited the president-elect in december the latter introduced the subject of the cabinet saying that he supposed i had some experience in cabinet-making that he had a job on hand and as he had never learned that trade he was disposed to avail himself of the suggestions of friends the making of a cabinet he continued now that he had it to do was by no means as easy as he had supposed that he had even before the result of the election was known assuming the probability of success fixed upon the two leading members of his cabinet but that in looking about for suitable men to fill the other departments he had been much embarrassed partly from his want of acquaintance with the prominent men of the day and partly he believed because that while the population had greatly increased really great men were scarcer than they used to be the two members of his cabinet on whom lincoln fixed so early were seward and chase he wrote seward on december eighth asking permission to nominate him as secretary of state and saying it has been my purpose from the day of the nomination at chicago to assign you by your leave this place in the administration i have delayed so long to communicate that purpose in deference to what appeared to me a proper caution in the case nothing has been developed to change my view in the premises and i now offer you the place in the hope that you will accept it and with the belief that your position in the public eye your integrity ability learning and great experience all combine to render it an appointment pre-eminently fit to be made seward took three weeks to consider and finally on december twenty eighth wrote that after due reflection and much self-distrust he had concluded it was his duty to accept lincoln did not approach chase on the subject of the cabinet until some three weeks after he had written seward then on december thirty first he wrote him this brief note in these troublous times i would much like a conference with you please visit me here at once chase reached springfield on the evening of january third and lincoln in his informal way went to the hotel to see him chase afterward described the interview in a letter to a friend he said he had felt bound to offer the position of secretary of state to mr seward as the generally recognized leader of the republican party intending if he declined it to offer it to me he did not wish that mr seward should decline it and was glad that he had accepted and now desired to have me take the place of secretary of the treasury chase did not promise to accept only to think it over and so the situation stood until the appointment was actually made in march it was pennsylvania and the south that gave lincoln the greatest trouble pennsylvania he told weed any more than new york or ohio cannot be overlooked her strong republican vote not less than her numerical importance entitles her to a representative in the cabinet after a careful balancing of matters as he called it he concluded to appoint simon cameron as the pennsylvania cabinet member and on december thirty first he gave cameron who had been for three days in springfield discussing the situation the following letter honorable simon cameron 
my dear sir i think fit to notify you now that by your permission i shall at the proper time nominate you to the united states senate for confirmation as secretary of the treasury or as secretary of war which of the two i have not yet definitely decided please answer at your earliest convenience your obedient servant a lincoln cameron had scarcely reached home with his letter before those opposed to him in pennsylvania had frightened lincoln into believing that the lack of trust in cameron's political honesty which existed throughout the country would destroy faith in the new cabinet lincoln immediately wrote cameron that things had developed which made it impossible to take him into the cabinet later he assured cameron that the withdrawal did not spring from any change of view as to the ability or faithfulness with which he would discharge the duties of the place and he promised not to make a cabinet appointment for pennsylvania without consulting him and giving all the weight he consistently could to his views and wishes there the matter remained until march among conciliatory republicans there was a strong desire that lincoln find a member of his cabinet in the south it was believed that such an act would be taken as proof that the new president intended to consider the claims of the south lincoln did not believe the idea practical and he showed the difficulties in the way very shrewdly by causing to be inserted on december twelfth in the illinois journal a paper popularly called his organ the following short editorial we hear such frequent allusions to a supposed purpose on the part of mr lincoln to call into his cabinet two or three southern gentlemen from the parties opposed to him politically that we are prompted to ask a few questions first is it known that any such gentleman of character would accept a place in the cabinet second if yea on what terms does he surrender to mr lincoln or mr lincoln to him on the political differences between them or do they enter upon the administration in open opposition to each other the demand continued however we told lincoln in december that in his opinion at least two of the members of the cabinet should be from the south lincoln was doubtful if they could be trusted there are men in maryland virginia north carolina and tennessee replied weed for whose loyalty under any circumstances and in any event i would vouch well said lincoln let me have the names of your white blackbirds weed gave him four names mr seward a little later suggested several and mr greeley likewise sent him a list of five southerners whom he declared it would be safe to take into the official family of all those named lincoln preferred john a gilmer of north carolina and he invited him to come to springfield for an interview as late as january twelfth he wrote to seward i still hope mr gilmer will on a fair understanding with us consent to take a place in the cabinet i fear if we could get we could not safely take more than one such man that is not more than one who opposed us in the election the danger being to lose the confidence of our own friends mr gilmer did not accept mr lincoln's invitation to springfield however and nothing ever came of the overture made him the nearest approach lincoln made to selecting a cabinet member from the south was in the appointment of edward bates of missouri he was one of the men whom lincoln had decided upon as soon as he knew of his election and he was the first after seward to be notified a representative from indiana was desirable and caleb smith was put on the slate provisionally it was necessary too that new england have a place in the cabinet mr lincoln had three candidates all of whom he thought well tuck of new hampshire banks of massachusetts gideon wells of connecticut but he made no decision until after he reached washington about the middle of january eighteen sixty one lincoln began to prepare his inaugural address a more desperate situation than existed at that moment it would be hard to imagine thus far every peace measure had failed and the endless discussions of press and senate chamber were daily increasing the anger and the bewilderment of the people four states had left the union and the south was rapidly accepting the idea of separate nationality the north was desperate and helpless all the bitterness and confusion centered about lincoln a hundred things told him how serious was the situation 
the averted faces of his townsmen of southern sympathies, the warnings of good men who sought him from north and south, letters threatening him with death, sketches of gibbets and stilettos in every mail. But in spite of all these distracting circumstances, when he thought it time to write the inaugural address, he calmly locked himself up in an upper room over a store, across the street from the State House, where he had his office, and there, with no books but a copy of the Constitution, Henry Clay's Speech of 1850, Jackson's Proclamation Against Nullification, and Webster's Reply to Hain, he prepared the document. Wishing to have several copies of it, he went to the general manager of the Illinois State Journal, Major William N. Belash, now of San Diego, California, to arrange for them. Major Belash has prepared for this work a statement of the incident. In relation to the printing of the draft of his first inaugural address, my recollection is very clear that his manner was as free from formality and affectation as it would have been had he been ordering the printing of a legal document. He merely asked me, one day early in January, 1861, if I could print his address in a certain style without its contents becoming known, and upon being assured that I could do so, he remarked that he would give me the manuscript in a few days. Not long after this, he placed the momentous paper in my hands. I had the work done at once, under my personal supervision, in a private room in the journal building, by a trusted employee sworn to secrecy. When it was finished, I returned the manuscript to Mr. Lincoln, together with the twenty printed copies ordered, one of which he himself gave to me, and it has been retained in my possession ever since. I may remark in passing that the manuscript was all in his own handwriting, and was almost entirely free from alterations or interlineations. He did not ask to see a proof, reposing entire confidence in my careful supervision. Neither the original draft nor the printed sheets were ever out of my immediate custody for an instant during the time occupied in the printing and I doubt whether any of the score or more of typos employed in the journal office had even the slightest suspicion that this important state paper was then being put in type under the same roof with them. Be this as it may, the secret was well kept, although the newspapers employed every conceivable means to obtain a hint of its tenor, and the whole country was in a state of feverish anxiety to learn what the policy of the new president was to be. Although Lincoln met the appalling events which preceded his inauguration with an outward calm, which led many people to say that he did not realize the seriousness of the situation, he was keenly alive to the dangers of the country and to the difficulty of his own position. So full of threats and alarms had his life become by the time of his election that the mysticism of his nature was awakened, and he was the victim of an hallucination which he afterwards described to different friends, among them Noah Brooks, who tells the story in Lincoln's own words. It was just after my election in 1860, when the news had been coming in thick and fast all day, and there had been a great hurrah, boys, so that I was well tired out and went home to rest, throwing myself down on a lounge in my chamber. Opposite where I lay was a bureau with a swinging glass upon it, and here he got up and placed furniture to illustrate the position. And looking in that glass, I saw myself reflected nearly at full length but my face, I noticed, had two separate and distinct images, the tip of the nose of one being about three inches from the tip of the other. I was a little bothered, perhaps startled, and got up and looked in the glass, but the illusion vanished. On lying down again, I saw it a second time, plainer, if possible, than before, and then I noticed that one of the faces was a little paler, say five shades, than the other. I got up, and the thing melted away, and I went off, and in the excitement of the hour forgot all about it, nearly but not quite, for the thing would once in a while come up and give me a little pang, as if something uncomfortable had happened. When I went home again that night, I told my wife about it, and a few days afterward I made the experiment again, when, with a laugh, sure enough, the thing came again, 
but I never succeeded in bringing the ghost back after that, though I once tried very industriously to show it to my wife, who was somewhat worried about it. She thought it was a sign that I was to be elected to a second term of office, and that the paleness of one of the faces was an omen that I should not see life through the last term. A far deeper significance than this touch of superstition is a look into the man's heart which Judge Gillespie, a lifelong friend of Lincoln, left, and which his daughter, Mrs. Josephine Gillespie Prickett, of Edwardsville, Illinois, has kindly put at my service. Early in January, Judge Gillespie was in Springfield, and spent the night at Mr. Lincoln's home. It was late before the President-elect was free, and then the two men seated themselves by the fire for a talk. I attempted, said Judge Gillespie, to draw him into conversation relating to the past, hoping to divert him from the thoughts which were evidently distracting him. Yes, yes, I remember, he would say to my references to old scenes and associations. But the old-time zest was not only lacking, but in its place was a gloom and despondency entirely foreign to Lincoln's character as I had learned to know it. I attributed much of this to his changed surroundings. He sat with his head lying upon his arms, which were folded over the back of his chair, as I had often seen him sit on our travels after an exciting day in court. Suddenly he roused himself. "'Gillespie,' said he, I would willingly take out of my life a period in years equal to the two months which intervene between now and my inauguration to take the oath of office now. Why? I asked. Because every hour adds to the difficulties I am called upon to meet, and the present administration does nothing to check the tendency toward dissolution. I, who have been called to meet this awful responsibility, am compelled to remain here doing nothing to avert it or lessen its force when it comes to me. I said that the condition of which he spoke was such as had never risen before, and that it might lead to the amendment of such an obvious defect in the Federal Constitution. It is not of myself I complain, he said, with more bitterness than I ever heard him speak before or after. But every day adds to the difficulty of the situation and makes the outlook more gloomy. Secession is being fostered rather than repressed, and if the doctrine meets with a general acceptance in the border states, it will be a great blow to the government. Our talk then turned upon the possibility of avoiding a war. It is only possible, said Mr. Lincoln, upon the consent of this government to the erection of a foreign slave government out of the present slave states. I see the duty devolving upon me. I have read upon my knees the story of Gethsemane, where the Son of God prayed in vain that the cup of bitterness might pass from him. I am in the garden of Gethsemane now, and my cup of bitterness is full and overflowing." I then told him that, as Christ's prayer was not answered, and his crucifixion had redeemed the great part of the world from paganism to Christianity, so the sacrifice demanded of him might be a great beneficence. Little did I then think how prophetic my words were to be, or what a great sacrifice he was called to make. I trust and believe that that night, before I let him go, I shed some rays of sunlight into that troubled heart. Ere long he came to talk of scenes and incidents in which he had taken part, and to laugh over my reminders of some of our professional experiences. When I retired, it was the master of the house and chosen ruler of the country who saw me to my room. Joe, he said, as he was about to leave me, I suppose you will never forget that trial down in Montgomery County, where the lawyer associated with you gave away the whole case in his opening speech. I saw you signaling to him, but you couldn't stop him. Now, that's just the way with me and Buchanan. He is giving away the case, and I have nothing to say and can't stop him. Good night. End of section 24。section 25 of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Lincoln as President-Elect. Part 2. But the time for going to Washington was drawing near. 
there had been considerable discussion about when he had better go so many threats had been made and so many rumors were in the air that the party leaders had begun to feel as early as december that the president-elect might never get to washington alive even seward optimist as he was felt that precautions had better be taken and he wrote lincoln from washington on december twenty eighth there is a feverish excitement here which awakens all kinds of apprehensions of popular disturbance and disorders connected with your assumption of the government i do not entertain these apprehensions myself but it is worth consideration in our peculiar circumstances that accidents themselves may aggravate opinion here habit has accustomed the public to anticipate the arrival of a president-elect in this city about the middle of february and evil-minded persons would expect to organize the demonstrations for that time i beg leave to suggest whether it would not be well for you keeping your own counsel to be prepared to drop into the city a week or ten days earlier the effect would be probably reassuring and soothing mr lincoln replied i have been considering your suggestions as to my reaching washington somewhat earlier than is usual it seems to me the inauguration is not the most dangerous point for us our adversaries have us now clearly at disadvantage on the second wednesday of february when the votes should be officially counted if the two houses refuse to meet at all or meet without a quorum of each where shall we be i do not think that this counting is constitutionally essential to the election but how are we to proceed in absence of it in view of this i think it is best for me not to attempt appearing in washington till the result of that ceremony is known the peace of the capital was however in good hands general scott the commander-in-chief of the army had even before the election seen the trouble coming and had pleaded with the administration to dispose of the united states forces in such a way as to protect threatened property early in january he succeeded in securing a guard for washington the fear that the electoral vote would never be counted partially subsided then and lincoln announced that he would leave springfield on february eleventh the fortnight before his departure he gave to settling up all his private business and saying good-bye to his old friends his stepmother was still living near charleston in coles county and thither he went to spend a day with her and to visit his father's grave the comfort and happiness of his stepmother had been one of his cares from the time he began to be self-supporting and in this farewell visit he assured himself that her future was provided for mrs lincoln who was now a very old woman and might naturally doubt whether she would live to see her son again was not concerned about herself at this time the threats which pursued lincoln had reached her and in bidding him good-bye she sobbed out her belief that she would never see him again that his life would be taken the same fear was expressed by many of lincoln's early friends who came to springfield to say good-bye to him in the multitude of partings which took place in these last days none was more characteristic than that with his law partner herndon the day before his departure mr lincoln went to the office to settle some unfinished business after those things were all disposed of writes mr herndon he crossed to the opposite side of the room and threw himself down on the old office sofa which after many years of service had been moved against the wall for support he lay for some moments his face towards the ceiling without either of us speaking presently he inquired billy he always called me by that name how long have we been together over sixteen years i answered we've never had a cross word during all that time have we he gathered a bundle of papers and books he wished to take with him and started to go but before leaving he made the strange request that the signboard which swung on its rusty hinges at the foot of the stairway should remain let it hang there undisturbed he said with a significant lowering of the voice give our clients to understand that the election of a president makes no change in the firm of lincoln and herndon if i live i am coming back some time and then we'll go right on practicing law as if nothing had happened he lingered for a moment as if to take a last look at the old quarters and then passed through the door into the narrow hallway 
herndon says that he never saw lincoln more cheerful than on that day and judge gillespie who visited him a few days earlier found him in excellent spirits i told him that i believed it would do him good to get down to washington i know it will he replied i only wish i could have got there to lock the door before the horse was stolen but when i get to the spot i can find the tracks mr lincoln and his party were to leave springfield by a special train at eight o'clock on monday morning february eleventh and at precisely five minutes before eight o'clock he was summoned from the dingy waiting-room of the station slowly working his way through the crowd of friends and townspeople that had gathered to bid him good-bye he mounted the platform of the car and turning stood looking down into the multitude of sad friendly upturned faces for a moment a strong emotion shook him then removing his hat and lifting his hand to command silence he spoke my friends no one not in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting to this place and the kindness of these people i owe everything here i have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man here my children have been born and one is buried i now leave not knowing when or whether ever i may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon washington without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him i cannot succeed with that assistance i cannot fail trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good let us confidently hope that all will yet be well to his care commending you as i hope in your prayers you will commend me i bid you an affectionate farewell a sob went through the listening crowd as mr lincoln's broken voice asked their prayers and a choked exclamation we will do it we will do it rose as he ceased to speak upon all who listened to him that morning his words produced a deep impression i was only a lad of fourteen says mr lincoln dubois of springfield but to this day i can recall almost the exact language of that speech we have known mr lincoln for many years wrote the editor of the state journal we have heard him speak upon a hundred different occasions but we never saw him so profoundly affected nor did he ever utter an address which seemed to us so full of simple and touching eloquence so exactly adapted to the occasion so worthy of the man and the hour although it was raining fast when he began to speak every hat was lifted and every head bent forward to catch the last words of the departing chief when he said with the earnestness of a sudden inspiration of feeling that with god's help he should not fail there was an uncontrollable burst of applause the speech was of course telegraphed over the country and though politicians sneered at it the people were touched he had appealed to one of their deepest convictions the belief in a providence whose help was given to those who sought it in prayer the new president they said to one another was not only a man who had struggled with life like common people he was a man who believed as they did in god and was not ashamed to ask the prayers of good men the journey eastward through illinois which now began was full of incident no better description of it was ever given than that of thomas ross a brakeman on the presidential train the enthusiasm all along the line was intense as we whirled through the country villages we caught a cheer from the people and a glimpse of waving handkerchiefs and of hats tossed high into the air there was a great rush to shake hands with mr lincoln though of course only a few could reach him the crowds looked as if they included the whole population there were women and children there were young men and there were old men with gray beards it was soul-stirring to see these white-whiskered old fellows many of whom had known lincoln in his humbler days join in the cheering and hear them shout after him good-bye abe stick to the constitution and we will stick to you it was my good fortune to stand beside lincoln at each place at which he spoke at decatur tolano and danville at the state line the train stopped for dinner there was such a crowd that lincoln could scarcely reach the dining-room gentlemen said he as he surveyed the crowd if you will make me a little path so that i can get through and get something to eat i will make you a speech when i get back 
i never knew where all the people came from they were not only in the towns and villages but many were along the track in the country just to get a glimpse of the president's train i remember that after passing be meant we crossed a trestle and i was greatly impressed to see a man standing there with a shotgun as the train passed he presented arms i have often thought he was there a volunteer to watch the trestle and see that the president's train got over it in safety as i have said the people everywhere were wild everybody wanted to shake hands with lincoln and he would have to say my friends i would like to shake hands with all of you but i can't do it at danville i well remember seeing him thrust his long arm over several heads to shake hands with george lawrence walter whitney the conductor who went on to indianapolis told me when he got back that after lincoln got into a carriage men got hold of the hubs and carried the vehicle for a whole block at the state line i left the train and returned to springfield having passed the biggest day in my whole life it was nearly five o'clock in the afternoon before the party reached indianapolis where they were to spend the night an elaborate reception had been prepared and here mr lincoln made his first speech it was not long but it contained a paragraph of vital importance the discussion over the right of the government to coerce the south was at its height lincoln had never publicly expressed himself on this point in the indianapolis speech he said the words coercion and invasion are much used in these days and often with some temper and hot blood let us make sure if we can that we do not misunderstand the meaning of those who use them let us get exact definitions of these words not from dictionaries but from the men themselves who certainly deprecate the things they would represent by the use of words what then is coercion what is invasion with the marching of an army into south carolina without the consent of her people and with hostile intent toward them be invasion i certainly think it would and it would be coercion also if the south carolinians were forced to submit but if the united states should merely hold and retake its own forts and other property and collect the duties on foreign importations or even withhold the mails from places where they were habitually violated would any or all of these things be invasion or coercion do our professed lovers of the union who but spitefully resolve that they will resist coercion and invasion understand that such things as these on the part of the united states would be coercion or invasion of a state if so their idea of means to preserve the object of their great affection would seem to be exceedingly thin and airy if sick the little pills of the homeopathist would be much too large for them to swallow in their view the union as a family relation would seem to be no regular marriage but rather a sort of free love arrangement to be maintained only on passional attraction the speech was warmly applauded by the republican press it was the sign they had been seeking from mr lincoln but to the advocates of compromise it was a bitter message the bells of saint germain l'auxerrois have at length tolled forth the signal for massacre and bloodshed by the incoming administration said the new york herald a long public reception in the evening a breakfast the next morning with the governor of the state another reception at the hotel and then at ten o'clock on the morning of the twelfth mr lincoln's party left indianapolis for cincinnati several of the friends who had come from springfield left mr lincoln at indianapolis but others joined him and the train was as full of life and interest as it had been the day before there was too the same succession of decorated cheering towns the same desire to see and hear the president at every station at cincinnati where the second night was spent and where a magnificent reception was given him lincoln made two brief addresses in that to the mayor and citizens he was particularly happy i have spoken but once before this in cincinnati he said that was a year previous to the late presidential election on that occasion in a playful manner but with sincere words i addressed much of what i said to the kentuckians 
i gave my opinion that we as republicans would ultimately beat them as democrats but that they could postpone the result longer by nominating senator douglas for the presidency than they could in any other way they did not in any true sense of the word nominate mr douglas and the result has come certainly as soon as i ever expected i also told them how i expected they would be treated after they should have been beaten and i now wish to recall their attention to what i then said upon that subject i then said when we do as we say beat you you perhaps want to know what we will do with you i will tell you so far as i am authorized to speak for the opposition what we mean to do with you we mean to treat you as near as we possibly can as washington jefferson and madison treated you we mean to leave you alone and in no way interfere with your institutions to abide by all and every compromise of the constitution and in a word coming back to the original proposition to treat you so far as degenerate men if we have degenerated may according to the examples of those noble fathers washington jefferson and madison we mean to remember that you are as good as we that there is no difference between us other than the difference of circumstances we mean to recognize and bear in mind always that you have as good hearts in your bosoms as other people or as we claim to have and treat you accordingly fellow citizens of kentucky friends brethren may i call you in my new position i see no occasion and feel no inclination to retract a word of this if it shall not be made good be assured the fault shall not be mine these conciliatory remarks were received with great enthusiasm the crowd rushing at him as soon as he had finished patting him on the back and almost wrenching his arms off in their efforts at showing their approval on wednesday morning mr lincoln left cincinnati for columbus although few stops were made he was kept busy receiving the committees and politicians who boarded the train here and there and who were indefatigable in their efforts to draw from him some expression of his views mr lincoln felt that to answer their questions would be the gravest indiscretion and he resorted to stories and jests in his efforts not to commit himself or offend his visitors the reports of his levity as more than one felt this practice to be were telegraphed over the country and bitterly commented upon by a large part of the press so far however as the stories mr lincoln told on his journey have come to us they contain quite as much political wisdom as a sober dissertation could have contained thus there was a great deal of discussion en route about the possibility of reconciling the northern and southern democrats mr lincoln was appealed to well he said i once knew a good sound churchman called brown who was on a committee to erect a bridge over a very dangerous and rapid river several engineers had failed and at last brown said he had a friend jones who he believed could build the bridge jones was accordingly summoned can you build this bridge asked the committee yes replied jones i could build a bridge to the infernal regions if necessary the committee was horrified but after jones had retired brown said thoughtfully i know jones so well and he is so honest a man and so good a builder that if he says he can build a bridge to hades why i believe it but i have my doubts about the abutments on the infernal side so said lincoln when politicians say they can harmonize the northern and southern wings of the democracy why i believe them but i have my doubts about the abutments on the southern side at columbus the brilliant receptions of indianapolis and cincinnati were repeated and here mr lincoln addressed briefly the state legislature one clause of his remarks proved to be most unfortunate allusion has been made to the interest felt in relation to the policy of the new administration in this i have received from some a degree of credit for having kept silence and from others some depreciation i still think that i was right 
in the varying and repeatedly shifting scenes of the present and without a precedent which could enable me to judge by the past it has seemed fitting that before speaking upon the difficulties of the country i should have gained a view of the whole field being at liberty to modify and change the course of policy as future events may make a change necessary i have not maintained silence from any want of real anxiety it is a good thing that there is no more than anxiety for there is nothing going wrong it is a consoling circumstance that when we look out there is nothing that really hurts anybody we entertain different views upon political questions but nobody is suffering anything this is a most consoling circumstance and from it we may conclude that all we want is time patience and a reliance on that god who has never forsaken this people a hostile press took the phrases there is nothing going wrong there is nothing that really hurts anybody nobody is suffering anything and used them apart from the context to prove that the president-elect did not grasp the situation at newark new jersey a week later just before the presidential party passed through a poster appeared in the town quoting these sentences and calling on the unemployed to meet at the station when mr lincoln's train arrived and show the president that they emphatically differed from these sentiments nothing came of this attempt to create a disturbance on thursday morning february fourteenth the presidential party was again en route this time bound for pittsburgh lincoln must have made this journey with a lighter heart than that of the day before for the danger that the counting of the electoral vote would be interfered with was now over the night before at columbus he had received a telegram which read the votes have been peaceably counted you are elected the ceremony had passed off without incident at pittsburgh where the night of the fourteenth was spent the president spoke to an immense crowd and as the issue in pennsylvania had been so largely protection it was to that doctrine that he gave his chief attention nothing could have pleased the iron city better the people were so wild with enthusiasm that it took the combined efforts of the police and militia to get the presidential party on the train and out of town from the hour that lincoln's coercion remarks at indianapolis reached the country he had received telegraphic congratulations and remonstrances at every stop of the train the remarks at columbus produced a similar result and he seems to have concluded at this point to make his future speeches more general at cleveland buffalo albany and new york there was nothing in what he said that his enemies could fasten on his journey from pittsburgh eastward was in no way different from what it had been previously there were the same crowds of people at every station the same booming of cannon gifts of flowers receptions at hotels breakfasts dinners and lunches with local magnates all along the route in the east as in the west the people were out everywhere there were flags and banners and mottoes the party in the train continued to change as it had done committees and leading citizens replacing each other in rapid succession none of these accessions aroused more interest among other members of the party than horace greeley who appeared unexpectedly at girard ohio bag and blankets in hand and after a ride of twenty miles with mr lincoln departed at buffalo where mr lincoln spoke on saturday the sixteenth a bit of variety was infused into the celebration by the fulfilment of an election wager the loser was to saw a cord of wood in front of the american house and present it to the poorest negro to be found he accordingly appeared with a wagon-load of cordwood just before mr lincoln began his speech from the hotel balcony and during the address sawed vigorously the journey through new york state with the elaborate ceremonies at albany and new york city occupied three days and it was not until the evening of february twenty first that lincoln reached philadelphia the day had been a hard one he had left new york early had replied to greetings at jersey city and again at newark had addressed both branches of the new jersey legislature at trenton and gone through a formal dinner there and now though it was dark and cold he was obliged to ride in state through the streets of philadelphia to his hotel where hundreds of visitors soon were surging in to shake his hand the hotel was still crowded with guests when he was summoned to the room of one of his party mr norman judd 
there he was introduced to mr allen pinkerton who as mr judd explained was a chicago detective and had a story to lay before him pinkerton informed me said mr lincoln afterwards in relating the affair to benson j lossing that a plan had been laid for my assassination the exact time when i expected to go through baltimore being publicly known he was well informed as to the plan but did not know that the conspirators would have pluck enough to execute it he urged me to go right through with him to washington that night i did not like that i had made engagements to visit harrisburg and to go from there to baltimore and i resolved to do so i could not believe that there was a plot to murder me i made arrangements however with mr judd for my return to philadelphia the next night if i should be convinced that there was danger in going through baltimore i told him that if i should meet at harrisburg as i had at other places a delegation to go with me to the next place then baltimore i should feel safe and go on mr lincoln left mr pinkerton and started to his room on the way he met ward layman also a member of his party who introduced frederick seward the son of the senator mr seward who relates this story in the life of his father told mr lincoln that he had a letter for him from his father the letter informed mr lincoln that general scott and colonel stone the latter the officer commanding the district of columbia militia had just received information which seemed to them convincing that a plot existed in baltimore to murder him on his way through the city mr seward besought the president to change his plan and go forward secretly mr lincoln read the note through twice slowly and thoughtfully then looked up and said to mr seward do you know anything about the way this information was obtained no mr seward knew nothing did you hear any names mentioned did you for instance ever hear anything said about such a name as pinkerton no mr seward had heard no names mentioned save those of general scott and colonel stone i may as well tell why i ask said mr lincoln there were stories and rumors some time ago before i left home about people who were intending to do me a mischief i never attached much importance to them never wanted to believe any such thing so i never would do anything about them in the way of taking precautions and the like some of my friends though thought differently john and others and without my knowledge they employed a detective to look into the matter it seems he has occasionally reported what he found and only to-day since we arrived at this house he brought this story or something similar to it about an attempt on my life in the confusion and hurly-burly of the reception at baltimore surely mr lincoln said mr seward that is a strong corroboration of the news i bring you he smiled and shook his head that is exactly why i was asking you about names if different persons not knowing of each other's work have been pursuing separate clues that led to the same result why then it shows there must be something in it but if this is only the same story filtered through two channels and reaching me in two ways then that don't make it any stronger don't you see after a little further discussion on the subject mr lincoln rose and said well we haven't got to decide it to-night anyway and i see it is getting late you need not think i will not consider it well i shall think it over carefully and try to decide it right and i will let you know in the morning the next day was washington's birthday the hauling down of the stars and stripes in the south and the substituting of state flags had stirred the north deeply the day the first palmetto flag was raised in south carolina a new reverence for the national emblem was born in the north the flag began to appear at every window in every buttonhole on january twenty ninth kansas was admitted into the union without slavery thus adding a new star to the thirty-three then in the field and for raising the new flag thus made necessary washington's birthday became almost a universal choice in philadelphia it was arranged that the new flag for independence hall be raised by mr lincoln the ceremony took place at seven o'clock in the morning mr lincoln's brief speech was one of the best received of all he made on the journey i am filled with deep emotion at finding myself standing in this place where were collected together the wisdom the patriotism the devotion to principle from which sprang the institutions under which we live 
you have kindly suggested to me that in my hands is the task of restoring peace to our distracted country i can say in return sir that all the political sentiments i entertain have been drawn so far as i have been able to draw them from the sentiments which originated in and were given to the world from this hall i have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the declaration of independence i have often pondered over the dangers which were incurred by the men who assembled here and framed and adopted that declaration i have pondered over the toils that were endured by the officers and soldiers of the army who achieved that independence i have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this confederacy so long together it was not the mere matter of separation of the colonies from the motherland but that sentiment in the declaration of independence which gave liberty not alone to the people of this country but hope to all the world for all future time it was that which gave promise that in due time the weights would be lifted from the shoulders of all men and that all should have an equal chance this is the sentiment embodied in the declaration of independence now my friends can this country be saved on that basis if it can i will consider myself one of the happiest men in the world if i can help to save it if it cannot be saved upon that principle it will be truly awful but if this country cannot be saved without giving up that principle i was about to say i would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender it now in my view of the present aspect of affairs there is no need of bloodshed and war there is no necessity for it i am not in favor of such a course and i may say in advance that there will be no bloodshed unless it is forced upon the government the government will not use force unless force is used against it my friends this is wholly an unprepared speech i did not expect to be called on to say a word when i came here i supposed i was merely to do something toward raising a flag i may therefore have said something indiscreet cries of no no but i have said nothing but what i am willing to live by and if it be the pleasure of almighty god to die by it was after returning from the flag raising at philadelphia that lincoln told his friends that he had decided to go on to washington at whatever time they thought best after his only remaining engagement was filled viz to meet and address the pennsylvania legislature at harrisburg that afternoon the engagement was carried out and late in the afternoon he was free it had been arranged that he leave harrisburg secretly at six o'clock in the evening with colonel layman the rest of his party to know nothing of his departure but mr lincoln did not like to go without at least informing his companions and ask that they be called i reckon they'll laugh at us judd he said but you had better get them together several of the party when told of the project opposed it violently arguing that it would expose mr lincoln to ridicule and the charge of cowardice he however answered that unless there was something besides ridicule to fear he was disposed to carry out mr judd's plan at six o'clock he left his hotel by a back door bareheaded a soft hat in his pocket and entering a carriage was driven to the station where a car and engine unlighted save for a headlight awaited him a few minutes after eleven o'clock he was in philadelphia where the night train for washington was being held by order of the president of the road for an important package this package was delivered to the conductor as soon as it was known that mr lincoln was on the train at six o'clock the next morning after an undisturbed night he was in washington where mr washburn and mr seward met him and with devout thanksgiving conducted him to willard's hotel there to remain until after the inauguration there were still nine days before the inauguration and nine busier days mr lincoln had not spent since his election he was obliged to make visits to president buchanan congress and the supreme court and under mr seward's guidance this was done at once he received too great numbers of visitors including many delegations and committees the hon james harlan of iowa at that time united states senator called on mr lincoln on february twenty third the day of his arrival 
he was overwhelmed with callers says mr harlan the room in which he stood the corridors and halls and stairs leading to it were crowded full of people each one apparently intent on obtaining an opportunity to say a few words to him privately it was in these few days before his inauguration that the great fight over the future cabinet was made as we have seen lincoln had made his selections subject to events before he left springfield when he reached washington he sought counsel on his proposed appointments from great numbers of the leading men of the country if they did not come to him he went to them thus ex-senator harlan in an unpublished manuscript recollections of abraham lincoln tells how the president-elect sounded him on the cabinet a page came to me at my desk in the senate chamber writes mr harlan and said the president-elect is in the president's room and wishes to see you i confess that i felt a little flurried by this announcement i had not been accustomed to being called in by presidents of the united states hence to gain a little time for self-composure i said to the little page how do you know that the president-elect wishes to see me oh said he his messenger came to the door of the senate chamber and sent me to tell you all right said i you may tell the president's messenger that i will call immediately which of course i did without the least delay i was received by the president in person who after the ordinary greetings offered me a seat and seated himself near me no one else was in the room he commenced the conversation saying in a half playful half serious tone and manner i sent for you to tell me whom to appoint as members of my cabinet i responded saying mr president as that duty under the constitution devolves in the first instance on the president i have not given to the subject a serious thought i have no names to suggest and expect to be satisfied with your selections he then said he had about concluded to nominate william h seward of new york as secretary of state edward bates of missouri for attorney general caleb b smith of indiana for secretary of the interior gideon wells of connecticut for secretary of the navy montgomery blair of maryland for postmaster general and that he thought he ought to appoint simon cameron of pennsylvania and salmon p chase of ohio for the remaining two places but was in doubt which one to offer mr cameron and would like to have me express my opinion frankly on the point well said i mr president if that is the only question involved i have not the slightest doubt that mr chase ought to be made secretary of the treasury and then i proceeded to mention without hesitation or reserve my reasons for this opinion he thanked me cordially for my frankness i took my leave this interview lasted probably about ten or fifteen minutes not all of those with whom mr lincoln talked about his cabinet professed like senator harlan to be satisfied with his selections radical republicans mistrusting seward's spirit of compromise besought him to take chase and drop seward altogether conservatives on the contrary fearing chase's implacable no compromise spirit urged lincoln to omit him from the cabinet seward finally on march second probably thinking to force lincoln's hand withdrew his consent to take an appointment he said later that he feared a compound cabinet and did not wish to hazard himself in the experiment this action brought no immediate reply from mr lincoln he simply left seward's name where he had placed it at the head of the slate the struggle over cameron's appointment which had been going on for more than two months now culminated in a desperate encounter the appointment of blair was hotly contested caleb smith's seat was disputed by schuyler colfax in short it was a day and night battle of the factions of the republican party which raged around lincoln from the hour he appeared in washington until the hour of his inauguration in spite of all the arguments and threats from excited and earnest men to which he listened candidly and patiently lincoln found himself on the eve of his inauguration with the cabinet which he had selected four months before unchanged this fact had it been known might have modified somewhat the opinion expressed generally at the time that the new president would never be anything but the tool of chase or seward or of whoever proved to be the strong man of his cabinet that is if he was ever inaugurated of this last many had doubts 
and even at the last hour were betting in the hotel corridors in the streets of washington that abraham lincoln would never be president of the united states end of section twenty five end of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell read by chufi galeazzi roner park california